All right, here we go. Michael J. White, welcome back. Whoa, welcome back. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for having me again. Yep, hasn't yeah. been that long since last time. Right, yeah, but, and I had to travel about a half a mile to get here. Oh, yeah, if right? that. If that. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, we're going to be seeing you a lot more often in the near future. Yeah, I, I consider this a, a third home. There we go. Yeah. There we go. Well, first of all, you know, we're filming this on November 4th. Yeah. The day after the election, mm -hmm. and there still is no president right, right now. Number right. one, did you vote? Oh, of course. Okay. Of course. There you yeah. go. So did I. Yes. Yeah. I assume we both uh, voted for the same person. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for Biden. Yeah, yeah, yeah bro. Biden and Kamala Harris. Um, mm. At this time, you know, this is 10 a.m. West Coast time. Mm. Biden has 238 electoral votes. Trump has 213. Right. With how many states still outstanding? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven states. Right. It's the same cliffhanger that I went to sleep on last night. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like it just froze. And I was like, hey, ain't nothing moving. And so I I was wondering at first, I'm like, are they, are they doing this so nobody riots at four o'clock in the morning? <laughs> like, is, is, this is this planned? You know? Um, yeah, actually, six yeah. states. I, I miscounted. There's six mm. states left. Uh, yeah, Georgia, North Carolina, uh, Michigan, Nevada, Michigan, yeah. Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. Yeah, and Pennsylvania is pretty important. Yeah, Pennsylvania yeah. has 20 electoral votes. Yes. Uh, yes. The way it's set up now in terms of the leads, mm -hmm. uh, Wisconsin, Nevada, and Michigan are blue states mm -hmm. ahead right now for Biden. So if he wins all three of those, mm -hmm. he's going to become president. Yeah. And then we're going to start the war of, of <laughs> fake I mean, votes. Everybody's and... so paranoid about this whole. Uh, come on now, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, 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 I don't, I don't subscribe to that because I mean, hey, where are your targets? Where are your targets? If, if, if somebody wants to lash out at Democrats, other than a Democratic like office, where are your, where are your targets? So really, what's to be really afraid of? Like, it's like, I don't know. I mean, it's, there's anger or whatever, but you got to focus it somewhere. It's not like, I mean, well, Trump supporters, you can kind of see them. They they kind of <laughs> they kind of wear <laughs> they wear hats and everything else, and it's it's really not a smart thing because they're they're too easy to infiltrate. Because all you got to do is wear a, a Trump hat, and you infiltrate in. them and you you blend in and you can right. eradicate a whole bunch of people. I'm not trying to give people ideas, but <laughs> but it, it would be kind of easy to do. Living in LA, like we both do, we see a lot of these businesses boarded mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. People were worried about riots yeah. and whatever else. The the Proud Boys were talking about a yeah. civil war. Mm -hmm. Here's what I think is gonna happen. I think a couple of dumb white guys are gonna do something stupid. Yeah. And either get killed by the police or just get arrested. And then everyone else is going to say, ah, never mind. We'll just, yeah, <laughs> we'll just go it, along it, with We, we are on this. I, I think about the same thing. It's like, I mean, people, I mean, anytime, like it's just, just as a fighting principle, mm -hmm. if I'm, if I'm caught up in my emotions, I'm going to make a bunch of mistakes. Right. Yep. And I'm going to be obvious to everybody else. So there is a police force that's militarized. That's waiting to do shit. Just waiting to do shit. Oh, give me an enemy so I could come on, man. Like you don't want to do that to yourself. It's not like a race war. No, no, no. It's it's oh, it's disgruntled, angry people versus the armed forces. Right. Who's just like you know drooling to like use some of that shit they got. Right. So it's yeah. like you don't want to do that. It's they're just waiting for you to step across that line. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's that's and that's not even a color thing. That's just like a, you know, I wish a motherfucker would thing. <laughs> you know, that's what it is. Right. Well. Yeah. My theory has always been this, and I've been saying this for weeks now, is that I think Trump realizes the moment he steps out of the White House, he's going to be arrested. Possibly. So, yeah. so his goal is this: is to get one more term. And potentially get someone like a Pence to become president, to succeed him, 
and then pardon him right away. See, there you go using logic, right? I I, I made that mistake, right? <laughs> logic ain't got shit to do with none of this. This is like this is a whole different like world, right? So you you I mean, how could you have figured we'd be here? Uh, all I all I know is like I take it as wow, this is a real lesson to about about uh people voting or just reaching for an excuse to do what's in their heart. Okay? I mean, if you're prejudiced, you're going to look for any reason to be prejudiced. I mean, mm-hmm. it's kind of like hey, just think about hey, uh people who wanted who were for OJ. They're like, you give us an excuse to to exonerate him. Oh, Mark Furman said the the N word. That's enough for us. Yeah, you know. Oh, uh, you want to hate Obama? Oh, he's a Muslim. Yeah, yeah. What, what, hell with logic. That's enough for us. So that that's kind of a thing. Is like, if you want to vote what's in your heart or just act on what's in your heart, you'll reach for anything that Trump may do or say to say, hey, you know, that validates. What I want to do, I mean, look, you know, look at me. Like, if somebody wants to hate on me, they go, "That's the guy who said he could beat Bruce Lee." You know what I mean? Right. And like, no matter what I've done, no matter what Ice Cube has done, oh, they want to whittle it down to, oh, that's the guy who did this. And it's like, never mind all the amazing things that somebody might have accomplished. You know, it's just the society we're in today. They just want to go to the most negative default setting. Yeah, uh, cancel culture. Yeah, yeah. Essentially, essentially that. Uh, well, that's sheep culture, yeah, for one thing. I agree. Yeah. Well, you mentioned Ice Cube. Mm-hmm. And Ice Cube met with Trump's party. He met with his son-in-law, mm-hmm. Jared Kushner. He also said he reached out to the Democrats, but they told him to check back after the election. Yeah. So, you know, the Republicans kind of put him on blast and said, oh, you know, thank you, Ice Cube, for meeting with us and so <laughs> right, forth. Right, right, yeah. And Ice Cube went on a hell of a promo tour to defend himself. Right, he yeah. He did every YouTube <laughs> channel with over 100 followers. and <laughs> Those optics are big, man. You, you, you know, those, they, you know, it's like you got played in a, you know, it's like they played a lot of people that way. Yeah, I yeah. mean, I, I've discussed this with some of my other guests and... I, number one, although I am a huge fan of Ice Cube in mm. terms of his his music and some mm. of his movies, I have not been a fan of Ice Cube's personality or some of the things that he mm-hmm. said. But I think that in this particular case, I really feel like he's really being targeted, you know, unfairly because it seems like he was there to do something good and to try to improve uh, the situation for Black Americans with whoever ends up being in power. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think it's the same thing where it, it's 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 funny how these things get manipulated like that because, uh, well, sometimes it it, it comes down to a ego to some degree, and and some some of our our uh, you know our leaders are not not leaders but our, our celebrities are fall victim to the ego thing, uh, and say, wow, I get a chance to do something. You know, they want to do something more than just make people laugh or make people shake their ass, right? So mm-hmm. it's like, oh, they're calling them upon me <laughs> to do this grand thing that can expand what who I am in this world. Steve Harvey, uh, Jim Brown, Ice Cube. Uh, and they, you know, they probably, of course, mean very well. It's like, wow, I, I think it's easy for someone to fall into that and say, hey, Mike, I want you to. I, I want to call upon you to help your your people, and get me out there. And then it's like, <laughs> gotcha. Right. You know what I mean. And so the spin could be anything it wants to be. Yeah. I mean, look at the Lil Wayne picture. I'll try not to look at that Lil Wayne picture. You know what I'm talking about, though, right? The picture with him and Trump. Is that, uh, yeah. It almost yeah. reminds me of the Sammy Davis Jr. Yeah, yeah. With, uh, yeah, yeah, we're old his, enough to know. <laughs> uh, yeah, with his know head. What that with is. Sammy yeah. Davis had his head on Nixon's shoulder like, yes, like his father or something mm-hmm. like that. And from what I understand, like I did some research on this and mm. I, I'm not 100% sure if this is true because there was a little bit of debate over this. Mm. But the story behind that I'd heard was Sammy Davis had 
a massive IRS bill that Nixon just made go away. Mm. Yeah, bro. There's a, there's a lot of that. People could be bought. That, there's a lot of it. I mean, I, like I said, those those optics, man, they, they, they're crucifying. Yeah. You know? Well, any black person that stood next to Trump has ultimately regretted it. Mm-hmm. Is the impression I've always gotten from Steve Harvey. Uh, you could say Kanye, although Kanye probably wouldn't admit it. But Kanye definitely was not respected for standing next to Trump like that mm-hmm. and wearing a MAGA hat. Boy, uh, you wore a MAGA hat, man. You know, to, yeah. to Lil Wayne, you know, as you could see now, uh, to Ice Cube. Mm-hmm. Everyone has ultimately not looked well by standing next to this man because we all know that, that Trump doesn't care about anybody, much less black people. It's it's amazing to me. It's like pimp culture, like on blast. Oh, yeah. Like you go, wait a minute, this cat, this pimp looks ridiculous, okay? Uh, he's got, he's hoeing folks, <laughs> right? And these women are, you know, giving him his money. All their money. I mean, yeah, yeah, and it's like, you you sit there and you go, well, how do you, how does this work? You, this. This cat is ridiculous. He's he's ridiculous. He's he's weak. He's like he's all of this, but he got you, like he's pimping you, mm-hmm. and you don't see it, and and it, it kind of blows your mind because you step back and you go, well, how 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 are you not seeing the same thing I'm seeing? Um, you know, with I mean, whether you like his policies or not, there's this this climate of hatred. Mm-hmm. That you'd have to agree with, I mean that that is that's just I don't know. I mean it's it's like how do you not know that it's a direct result of him saying, okay, you know, um, you know, let's let's insult folks, let's go let's go low on all these all these things, and you know, and it's just saying that, hey, man. Maybe we didn't know what our identity really was, and maybe it is. It, maybe it is this ugly, because you know I, I know for this race being this close, I was wrong about who we were. One of the best quotes I read recently was this: "Not all Republicans are racist, mm-hmm. but all racists are Republican." Yeah, I've, I've read that too. I've read that. Too. I can't find an instance to dispute that. Yeah, man, it, it's it's kind of like what's done in the dark, man. People vote their conscience and they like, yeah, you know, this guy, he's he's silly. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it's like I say for, there's half of the population that now know what black people go through. And I'll say it like that because it means like, okay, this covert stuff that, that that folks thought was in our imagination, not not welcome to it. Because that's you're sitting there scratching your head going, how could it be this close? Well, that's what we've run into. You know, that's what we've run into. Like, you know, well, this, you know, inequality. It's not our imaginations, right? You see, you're seeing firsthand. Yeah. You know, and you're feeling firsthand what we felt for a very long time. Is it's systemic. So it, it, you know, so be 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 shocked, but black people are not that damn shocked, right? I mean, because at the time, and right now, sixty-seven million people voted for Trump. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, in comparison to seventy million who voted for Biden, it's pretty close. Right, sixty-seven million people mm-hmm. voted for what the media has always denounced as a racist, a bigot. Someone with no experience, right. a liar, someone that has done a horrible job with COVID, uh, you know, in the has, face of has COVID. rallies. From what I understand, and we actually did an article about this. Mm. Let me actually pull this up so I can give the exact stats. Um, because uh, Biden was not doing these types of open air rallies. He was doing stuff in cars and social right. distancing and, you know, without a bunch of people smushed up with each other. According to a report from Stanford University, uh, 30,000 people caught COVID from Trump's rallies, which led to 700 deaths. So you really loved Trump to death to go to these rallies, literally. 
Yeah. 700 people died just by going to this man's rally. Yeah. And you could see it. No one's wearing masks. You know? Yeah. My, my pimp gave me HIV, <laughs> but I voted for him. <laughs> I love him, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, remember, I mean, was, so, yeah, it, Her- Herman Cain died yeah, from COVID. And, 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 and he's, like, he's Herman, at the rally. Who, I, I don't know that guy. It's like, like, did you not notice? But, but they're good at that. Like, whatever bad press, they just kind of sweep that under the rug, right? And they're about winning, right? Yeah. Herman Cain. There's a picture of him not wearing a mask and complaining that that masks are bullshit. He yeah. dies from COVID. Mm-hmm. He said then, he called it a pandemic. A pandemic. Yes. And then after he died, his Twitter account continued to tweet support for Trump mm-hmm. and downplay COVID. Which he right. died from, right. from his Twitter account, mm-hmm. zombie tweeting. You can't make this stuff up. This sounds like a bad movie, but this is actual real life. We got some uneducated folks out here, man. <laughs> a lot of them, and it's, and what you know, if anybody wants to just pay attention, it's like, hey, it's a lot more than you think. All right, a lot more is is a combination of uneducated or people who are just, you know, really deep down very prejudiced and feel very much like that man does. Mm-hmm. And it's a lot more than you think. Clearly, 67 million mm-hmm. <laughs> people out there. Yeah. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm someone that's been checking the news on COVID vaccines every day Yeah. since it started, just to see where we are. Uh, originally, there was supposed to be uh, you know, an FDA approval by October. That didn't happen. Trump mm-hmm. was claiming that by the election, there'll be a, a vaccine that Obviously didn't happen. Now we're hearing end of November, early December. You personally, when the when the vaccine is approved, will you take it? My face should tell you. <laughs> Man, it depends on who's telling me the information. I mean, I, mean, I can't trust what's coming from you know up top. I mean, Fauci, whatever, you know, it, it depends on well, all it's, of that. It's not Fauci, it's the FDA. Yeah. The FDA, which is not tied to to the president's office, they are going to go through the proper steps. Mm-hmm. And they've been going through the proper steps, which is why you don't have a vaccine right now. Yeah. But at the point that they get emergency uh, approval, will you take it? I, I, I don't think I would take it, personally. Why, why is that? Well, because um, I feel like you know, I might I might hedge my bets in a different way. Uh, I think I'm I don't believe I'm in the highest risk group. I know there are very healthy people who have take who have gotten it and died and died. Yes. Uh, I the I believe I have had it. You know, my whole family it felt like it went way th- right through my family in February. Well, uh, you could test yourself for that. Right. Yeah. But but the but the the antibodies they don't last long. Or whatever. They don't. So as in as far as the people con- contracting it again, it's a very low number that's that's done that. I mean, my my son, my 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 you know my daughters, my wife. I'm sure we went through that. My my son. Uh, had, I don't my, know. My, my, well, my son had the had the antibodies test. He was, and and he tested positive. He for was that? positive. You know, he was positive oh, for so the he's antibodies. Had it. Yeah, he's definitely had it. And he's been around you. Yeah, we had it at the same time. <laughs> oh, okay. because because that's when I for I didn't even know the the word COVID existed, you know. So like my my daughter and my wife both have asthma. They and they, it, it, it the fever lingered with them for like six weeks. For myself and my son, it was like five days, and it was exactly the symptoms that we were talking about, except, except for the. Uh, loss of taste. I was going through fevers and it was like, what the hell is this? But a lot of people was, were, were going through that. It was a, it was fe- February uh, last year. Okay. Of this year. Yeah. Well, what year is this? <laughs> I'm confused. That 2000. Yeah. yeah, just yeah. A blur. yeah. Uh, well, the leader of Dubai, uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid al Maktoum actually posted a picture of himself taking a Chinese vaccine. Mm. Uh, this man is worth uh, $30 billion. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I mean, he's also the prime minister of, I'm sorry, he's worth $18 billion. 
My bad. Yeah. My bad. Big difference in his lifestyle with that. Uh, So very wealthy man, very powerful man. He's taking it. He's taking the Chinese version of the vaccine, which hasn't gotten FDA approval yet. Well, whatever their approval is. But they're already, Mm -hmm. like 300,000 Chinese have already gotten injected with this thing. So they're- That's like a little village in China. Yeah. Yeah. But like- they're, they don't care. I mean, well, this is also a country where when you take it, you can't publicly say anything or else I'll throw you in jail. Yeah. You know, there's no free speech over there. There's mm-hmm. no free press. There's no Google. All right. Uh, so it's going to be interesting. I'm going to take it when it's available to people like myself, because when they roll it out, initially, the first thing they'll do is give it to, you know, the elderly. Mm-hmm. They'll give it to the frontline workers, like the hospital workers, the police firemen, whatever, people who have to interact with people. Yeah. Uh, so by the time it's available to, you know, healthy 40-something year olds like myself, there's already going to be a, a level of testing with Absolutely. probably millions I mean, of people. I mean, that's that's my attitude is I'll take yeah. it on the end. You know, exactly. On, you know, the, you know I, I feel pretty damn confident with, I mean, you know, and you know, I have friends that are like absolute influencers that I'm I talk to like on a weekly basis, like uh, Dr. John White. He's he's right there with uh, Sanjay Gupta and all all those guys. I mean, he happens to be a, a close personal friend, and he's like a leader in this whole COVID thing. So I get a lot of uh, information from you know, top top people. Yeah, I mean, I've taken the flu uh, the flu shot as well. I've been taking mm. that for the last couple of years. Yeah, I talked to my doctor. Yeah. Uh, I asked him if I should take it. He said yes. I asked him if he took it himself. He said yes. Mm. I'm like, okay, well, that's a yeah, that's a good enough indication <laughs> yeah. for me. And then you go, well, what's the what's the downside? Nothing. What? <laughs> you, you, you might get a yeah. little bit of a fever yeah. or whatever yeah. else. But look, uh, it's funny how everyone made fun of Michael Jackson for wearing a mask everywhere. And I could tell you that since COVID started, I have not gotten sick one time, which is very much a rarity for me. Yeah, I think Michael Jackson was wearing a mask for other reasons too. Though. Oh yeah, his face was kind of falling apart. Well, but the, the nose thing. The nose yeah, thing, yeah. yeah. The, yeah. That's why I'm saying his face was falling apart because of all the plastic surgery. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I think it was also for health reasons. And Maybe. I don't know, man. I kind of feel like mm. everyone who's gotten through this might end up wearing a mask for like the rest of their lives. Well, I mean, <laughs> in China, the, just like Ever since I've been going back to uh, going to China the last 15, 20, well, 20 years or so, that's just- Really? That's part- the thing? Oh, hell yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, hell yeah. You know, and, uh, in parts of Japan as well. But people did it for reasons, like great reasons, because if someone was sick, they naturally would wear a, a mask to mm-hmm. keep from spreading their germs. That's, that's a societal thing there. Yep. Yeah. So I used to wonder, like, what the hell is that? You know? But- I mean, you go to the airport, there's people with masks on all the time. And I'm like, that seems to be a little inconvenient, but that's what they do. Yeah. yeah. And it works. Yeah. Well, you recently had a video of you training with uh, John Bones Jones. Well, not a video of the actual training, but you guys yeah. hanging out post-training. Yeah, we'll yeah. We'll go we, ahead we got and show, the show that together. video now. Just got it in with this brother here. Yeah, we had a good time, man. It's <laughs> such an honor to have uh, Michael Ja out here in Albuquerque. This guy's a tremendous athlete, amazing kids, filled with knowledge, uh, not only in the martial arts, but in life. And uh, I'm truly uh, just inspired to have him here at the house. So, yeah, I, thank you, man. Bro, thank you. I got the fan out a little bit. Uh, Moving around with the with the GOAT yo, for a minute. I'm going to post a video on my social media account. I got my, I got my butt whooped. <laughs> I got, no, no, I, man. Got, I got humbled today. Oh man, we we had we had a good time. It was great. And bro, all right, well, got it in, and well, uh, this is gonna be the the first of many. First of ever. John is one of the. I mean, I I think he's the best best uh, UFC fighter alive, and uh, probably the person I wanted to spar with the most in this on the planet. Right, I've I've. Just luckily, I've been I've trained with some of the best people for years. I mean, from Maurice Smith and sparring with him when he was UFC heavyweight champion, and I mean Josh Barnett, uh, Gokhan Saki, some of my favorite people, uh, uh, Remy Bojaski. If somebody's a nerd into it like me, uh, Michael Bisbing, all that. Like, it's always been a, a chance to test myself or, or just train and you know um, just kind of exchange knowledge. Because for me, it's 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 more than just you know it's not a sport to me, right? So 
getting a chance to, to train with John Jones, that was great for both of us. But even though uh, John had said something about, oh, yeah, you know, I'm going to post the footage or whatever. And I thought about it. I'm like, I haven't really posted footage of anything. I mean, there's guys, there's champions who's trained with me at my house. <laughs> Don't let me do it again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You know, not to say, you know, kind of braggingly, like there's a lot of, there's a, I've been doing this for a long time. I could be a striking coach to anybody, right? Honestly, there's not many people, professional fighters, who have the striking skills that I have. That's just the truth. I'm not trying to be big headed. It's just the truth. I mean, I've, you know, I've sparked, you know, mainly champion, like Rampage Jackson when he was champion. Well, I, I let them speak about that. I don't want to, I would, I'd rather tell you times where I didn't do well, you know, against someone. Well, he weighs 205 pounds. Who? John. No, no, no. He weighs 235. He oh, so he's heavier, heavier than now. me. Oh, he's heavier now. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. I, I, guess, to, I guess this is his, yeah. like, fighting weight. And no, no. Is, that's when he's fighting. When he's fighting. Okay. Yeah. No, he's heavier than me. Like, we uh -huh. were sparring last week, and he's okay. he's heavier uh, than me. How much do you weigh? I'm, I'm 230. Okay. Yeah. So you guys are about the same weight. Yeah, yeah. He's Yeah. He's he's normally walking around as a heavyweight. He's 6'4". He's, you know. Right. And you're about, yeah. what, 6'2", 6 6'3"? Six, yeah. Six, one and a half, six two. Yes, yeah, so yeah. same same height yeah, as me. Basically, yeah. so he's a little taller than you, about yeah. the same weight. But he also has these ridiculous arms and legs. He's got the that are like just he's got the reach mutant, of yeah, a these, seven footer. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. He's got yeah. these mutantly long arms. Yeah, yeah. and legs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Uh, you know, you know the thing. So, okay, there's like I think I even said it in an interview here. I knew if we, we get together, there's going to be a lot of things that I do that is he's not used to and will be effective. I was right. Uh, but I, like I said before, I don't think I can get away with that several times. <laughs> like, I think he would get my number <laughs> the next time. And and like and actually, when we, we mixed it up a little bit, uh, you know, I had a, I have a sprained ankle. And when I, you know, kind of tied up with him to grapple. That dude is real strong. That he could have tossed me around, but we were not, we were not going to grapple because of the ankle thing, and I, I could not possibly try to lift him. I was barely holding my own weight, and, and and also I wasn't in the you know cardiovascular shape that he's in. So I mean, but we we exchanged you know uh, techniques, knowledge, all that type of stuff. Um, it was a lot of fun. I mean, I think. I think the the significance of it is more of a connection that's even beyond martial arts, really. Because, I mean, you know, I think it was important to him to have somebody who he, he views as a, a an elder who's in a similar bracket that's dealt with, you know, the, the prestige of knowing what you can do uh, with your hands and feet as a weapon and how how the you know male population looks at you and and um and also this whole fame thing and trying to develop under a microscope well yeah. re recently uh Khabib mm -hmm. had a you know had a match right and he announced his retirement afterwards yes and people were calling him the best ever and then i think john chimed in like okay well john's on. right about that i mean it, 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 john, john i mean i'm not I'm just saying that to be i'm I'm always going to be honest, whether this is my best friend or not. Yeah. But John's correct. I mean, come on, 15, 15, and like to to four uh, people. Of course, like I was just telling you before, everybody's going to jump on the, the the negative setting, right? Oh, there's PEDs. Okay, let's let's erase those those wins. Still, there's no competition. If you look at John's first, I mean, uh, could be fought four times, right? If you compare those to John's four fights, as far as when he got the championship and the next ones, there's no comparison to those wins compared to Khabib's wins. John's wins were 
far more dynamic. But he kept he kept going, and then, you know, of course, there, there was the bumps and bruises and things, you know, damage to his reputation that has made him less popular. You can't hate on Khabib. There's nothing to hate on with Khabib. Khabib is the man. That dude is. Oh, yeah. I mean, but it, he but, killed Conor McGregor. But yeah, yeah and and just personality wise, man, that guy is so solid. I mean, to me, I haven't seen that kind of spirit since like you know, uh, since like uh, who's the cat from Boston? Um, ah, boxer from Boston. Come on, man, uh, Hagler. Okay. Hag- like when somebody's that damn solid, right? And you just, you know, he just embodies a certain, uh, you know, just alpha kind of quality. Um, so yeah, Khabib is the man as far as that's a certain popularity wise. There's no blemish really, but you know, of course, but but you can't compare. If if you had John's equal fights at the same time, when he knocked out nothing but nothing but champions nothing but champions being uh Shogun Hua uh um Leota Machida was it Rashad no like those first four, they, they were nothing but champions so you it's, it's no comparison there so yeah i mean of course people may like could be more because there's no not many blemishes on his record yeah i mean Khabib is 29 and 0 Mm-hmm. Uh, John is twenty six one and zero. Yeah, but now as a champion, that's where you you, know, you got to oh, start comparing, yeah. comparing, right? Because you know what we are you're going to start adding John Jones's fights before he was a champion. You know, oh, that's true. I see what you're saying. And, and, and the uh, you know and how early, I mean, he was an early uh, champion, like you know. So and and it, it, it bears uh, to mention. To do that at that age, at the highest level. Well, uh, this interview's not out yet, but I just interviewed mm. uh, your friend Don Fry. Oh, Don, man, what a what a, what a he, he's a character. Yes, he's yeah. a character. Oh yeah, and it really. Uh, I mean, he came in, and uh, he had a cane. Yeah, his back. Yeah. He had like twenty back operations, mm-hmm. and he started showing me pictures, mm-hmm. where like his entire back was cut open. Like literally, like, yeah. like the skin is ripped open and stuff in the spine. And Man. apparently, after one of the back operations, he had a heart attack. Like outside the hospital, they had to bring him back. Uh, you just talk about, you know, for example, I interviewed Tito Ortiz, mm-hmm. and he started breaking down all his operations, and it was like, oh, I got this repair. Yeah, uh, this, he sounds that, like a that. scientist when he break, yeah. breaks it down, doesn't he? And, and it, yeah. it's like the. The way that these fighters, whether it's boxers or MMA guys, but would you say the MMA guys take more damage than the boxers? They take more bodily damage, but I believe boxers take more brain damage. Brain damage. Okay. So, yeah. so it's, it's something about a, a boxing glove yeah. that shakes the center of your head, it shakes your brain. Yeah. You know, because if I was going to shake your, your, your brain, I would do this. It, it, you know, when you have MMA, it's closer to bare fist. Where I have a bone, you know, my fist hitting a skull, right? That is bone on bone, and that takes up a lot of the, right. you know, the head doesn't move as much. But that boxing glove moves the center of the brain, huh. you know, it, it, with the the slight accelerations, like the delayed acceleration. Okay, well, yeah. also in MMA, you don't get hit in the face as much. Right. Yeah. In general, right. I'm sure with certain fights, it's even worse. But in general. A lot of the fights are won on on the floor, yeah, on the ground, yeah, yeah. So Don Fry really, really sacrificed himself, man. Uh, I mean, we talked about his fight with uh, Yoshiro uh, Takayama in yeah. Japan, where it looked like a a, a fucking hockey fight. Yeah. These guys literally mm. held each other and punched each other in the face for over a minute straight, yeah, and nonstop. I, I've never seen anything like it in life, right, right, in life. And you know, I don't know if you know this, but uh. Yashiro ended up getting paralyzed. Yeah, from from the neck down. You see that that's the thing. L- later on, not from this fight, but later on with a, with a, a wrestling uh, match. I think. Yeah, see, see, that's again where I talk about how my love for fighters because there's so it's such a part of them who's a part of me, you know, and so you know I I I see them in their 
you know, in the next chapter of their lives, you know, people forget about them. They move on. But these people, I mean, they, they fought their heart out for, for, you know, the public, for their fans. And it's just a very lonely existence. You know? Well, especially guys like Don Fry, who were there during damn near UFC 1. Uh, yeah, man, these are heroes. Yeah, like when there wasn't the big, you know, what Monster Energy drink wasn't tossing millions of dollars into yeah. the equation. Mm -hmm. uh, you could only watch this stuff on VHS. It was pay-per-view a little bit, but really VHS, going mm -hmm. to Blockbuster was the only way to watch it. There were no um, weight categories back then. You the early, the a, very early. Yeah, parts, I yeah. mean, in fact, yeah, Don Fry knocked out like a, like a 400 pound guy mm -hmm. <laughs> in one of his first fights. Yeah, yeah. Remember, we were even talking about this, how in the very early UFC fights, there was this one guy I remember it was this one black uh, fighter who had like one boxing glove. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they just did not know what they were doing back then. Yeah, yeah. And plus, like literally one boxing glove. And plus, taped they, to was, his they hand. were picking, they were hand picking people. Yeah. To be honest with you, I mean, it yeah. was smart. Yeah, and the, you were doing the Gracies, multiple. They, they were smart as hell. Yeah, you were doing multiple fights in one, in one, one tournament. Yeah. Unlike now, where you just do one fight and that's they, it. They didn't pick anybody that could give them that smoke. Yeah. So they were picking people that, who they knew they would look good defeating, and they bumped up their their um, backgrounds or whatever. A lot of these cats were not real fighters. I knew real fighters who were trying to infiltrate. Mm. I had personal friends that were trying to hide their records to see if they can get in the UFC and act like they couldn't fight that well. <laughs> and then... Be beat some ass, yeah. Yeah, but then, I mean, they, it's, they, they would find them out. And it's like, wait a minute, did you win this tough man contest in Arizona? And, and, and they're huh. like, oh, shoot, yeah. Yeah, you're, you're out. It, so but it was, hey, it was smart on their part. Yeah, it was more like it wrestling. Made, it made yeah. jujitsu look like, you know, unbeatable. Yeah. Yeah. But, man, yeah. There, was a lot of, there was a lot of killers out there that they were not dealing with. Yeah. And Hoist Gracie became a household name. You yeah. Know, there's this little skinny, exactly. small Brazilian guy that mm. was destroying people twice his size. Yeah, and that that built into people's psyche. That that's what you want to believe. That's what that's what movies are about. <laughs> right. So you know, so it was that, a movie, yeah. That's that's perfect. They here now I've you know, you've empowered everybody who feels inferior. Mm -hmm. You know? So, I mean that <laughs> that's exactly the the greatest thing. Like that was just brilliant. That's brilliant. Yep. You know? Well, uh, Javante Davis mm -hmm. recently had his uh, most recent knockout. The uppercut? Oh, yeah. That was brutal. Yeah. I've interviewed uh, Javante before. Mm -hmm. Cool dude. Uh, people, even back then, you know, I think we even talked about it in our interview, how people were making like the, the Mike Tyson comparison mm -hmm. uh, to him. I mean, he has a similar build. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know about the similar fighting style. You know, that's mm -hmm. more of a a question for you than me. Right, because I guess people had actually been comparing you to like a young Mike Tyson. Yeah, they compared me to Mike Tyson, a younger Floyd, Floyd Mayweather. Okay. Well, you know, Floyd doesn't knock people out in the first round. That's, that's a Tyson thing. <laughs> yeah. But do you think that Javante's going to go down as a great? I don't know. I don't, I haven't seen enough of him, hmm. to be honest with you. I've been, just, just been busy. I've been way behind on my, my uh, fight you know, uh, you know, seeing a lot of fights. I mean, just haven't yeah. seen a lot. Well, you know, speaking of Mike Tyson, Mike Tyson, Roy Jones is coming up still. Mm -hmm. And they're doing two round, uh, I'm sorry, they're doing two minute rounds. Two minute rounds, okay, okay. Usually it's- Three. Three. Yeah. And apparently both of them were unhappy about this. Well, I mean, you know, I would think Roy conference. should be very unhappy about that. Why is that? That, <laughs> I mean that 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 it kind of benefits Mike a lot more. Why is that? Because it's less endurance. Right, Mike is older. Well, it's not it's not that. It's just you know if you're a lighter weight, you know you 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 tend to like you can move more. You know, I mean, um, like yeah, if I if I'm going against a lighter person, I mean, just as you look at anything in in weight categories. How many punches are thrown by a lighter weight person as opposed to a heavier weight person? Okay. You know, so it, it's, 
it would benefit someone like Mike Tyson a great deal to have shorter rounds because he can be, you know, tenacious. He could just be, you know, overwhelming for two minutes, but it's harder to do that for three minutes. That that last minute, you might just be like zonked. Yeah. I mean, imagine if Roy Jones knocks out Mike Tyson. I don't think that would ever happen, personally. It could. You never know. Mm. You never know. You never know. That right uppercut? Nah. It, it, I, see, that's the, that's the thing that I'm talking about. Like the, there's a bone density. There's a different thing with light and heavyweight that you really, you rarely see a lighter weight knock out a heavier weighted person. That heavier weight person, like Mike Tyson's gotten hit by 250 pound heavyweights who walk around closer to 300. So mm -hmm. that's that's in a whole nother area where, where Roy, Roy Jones is fighting people under 200 pounds. It's a major difference. And so to get hit by somebody you know, that's, I mean, so with Mike Tyson being hit by somebody 250 is hit by a guy who walks around at 190. It's a big difference. I know, because, I mean, honestly, fighters, a heavier, a heavier guy could fight a super middleweight and not block. I mean, and just, boom, oh, good, nice. You know, you can walk through a lot of that. It's if yeah. you're a fighter, you you know that that's true. Yeah, I mean, this is why Mayweather's never been knocked down or knocked out. He's fighting 150 pound guys. They just simply don't hit as hard as heavyweights. Well, well yeah, but May Mayweather's his defense is. Well, you just don't see just, a lot of knockouts in that in that weight category. No, yeah, you, 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 you don't. just don't. Yeah, and yeah. you go lightweight, and you see even less. Like remember, you know. Pernell yeah, Whitaker what, had the most boring fights in the world, but he won them all. <laughs> yeah, like the, the the reason why people um, people really deep in the boxing game uh, was suspect of of uh, Pacquiao is because he was one of the only people who was lighter and came up and brought power with him. That never happens. Mm. That never happens. Roy Jones, when he went a weight class up. It's no way he's knocking out anybody. He's not he's not knocking out Tarver. Tarver's bone structure is heavier than, you know, I mean, it's it's yeah. it's just not done. Uh uh Chavez fighting fighting De La Hoya. People don't realize Chavez is much lighter. <laughs> you know, De La Hoya is a heavier dude. He's solid. That's the whole thing with like with John Jones. People think, oh, the guy's skinny. No, he's he's Rock solid bone, that, you know. Yeah. Against somebody's flesh and muscle, look at the look at the bone structure. That's what you got to look at. And so it, it's it's deceiving because people think about, oh, look how Pacquiao is just so, you know, so dynamic. But nah, uh, uh, he's fighting a heavier dude. Like Mayweather is heavier than Pacquiao. Yeah, you know, right. he's heavier than Pacquiao. He's not as muscular, but hell with muscle. That's his bone structure, his bone density. That's you. You ain't moving that. Well, I just did a whole interview with Larry Holmes, mm. and uh, he talked about getting knocked out by Tyson. Oh yeah, remember that fight? Oh yeah, that uh, was he, violent. Yeah, <laughs> he actually blamed it on uh, his arm getting caught in the ropes. He said he was getting ready to hit him with an uppercut, and his arm got yeah. caught. But you know, he also admitted that Mike Tyson. You know, hit like a motherfucker. Yeah, My, <laughs> Mike know? Tyson was the fastest heavyweight champ. He was the fastest heavyweight. Period. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and it was interesting, right? Because we talked about the whole story about how he even took that fight because he was completely retired. He was like in a band. <laughs> that was just not in a good. That was not a good choice. Well, he was completely retired. Mm -hmm. he, was, he was already rich. He wasn't squandering his money. Yeah, he was doing well with his. He business. was doing well. Yeah. As he still does to this day. Mm -hmm. You know, we went to his mansion and like mm -hmm. he's got a street named after him. He's got a statue. Yeah. He owns business centers and buildings. Absolutely. Uh, but he described the story. He said he was minding his own business and Don King showed up. <laughs> he said, I want you to fight Mike Tyson. He's like, man, you crazy. I'm not fighting. He's like, here's half a million dollars right here on the table. <laughs> Take it. It's yours. You ended up retiring. Uh, you were 37 years old. 
and you stayed retired until Don King shows up at your house one day. And what the hell that money come? <laughs> that money comes back. <laughs> Don't you know money make you talk? <laughs> money make you do crazy things. I didn't, you know, I had quit, retired, living, living in my nice house with my wife and with my kids. And Don King come with a big bucket of money and then what you gonna do? It's yours, Larry, it's yours. All is mine. Yes, that's yours. All you have to do is sign here. Sign where, Don? <laughs> right there, okay. <laughs> sign. Money is the root of all evil, man. Okay, so Don King shows up at your house and he says, I want you to fight Mike Tyson. I, well, my and first impression was, shit, you got to be crazy. Me? Fight Mike Tyson? He said, yeah, you can fight Mike Tyson. You can beat Mike Tyson. I said, I know I can get around all this stuff that you don't, but I can't beat Mike Tyson because there's a lot of things he don't do. He said, you can beat him, Larry. I know you can beat him. He said, I'm going to give you this many weeks to get ready. We're going to be like nine weeks. I had to train. And I said, damn, Don, I don't know about that. He says, here you go. Slapping on there, hit $500,000 on my hand. Right in the living room there, $5,000. I mean, 500000 What am I supposed to do? Don, what are you doing with all that money? Somebody going to rob you, man, around here. Ah, 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 ah. Rob me? No, you going to rob me, champ. Ah, ah, ah. But you better get this money. Well, it's interesting because, you know, we got into the whole world of boxing and how a lot of fighters take fights when they should have stopped completely. Mm -hmm. And that was the case with Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali had retired. Yeah. And hadn't had a fight in... Like I think like three or four years. And he was already undergoing the, you know, I don't know whether it was the Parkinson's mm -hmm. or whatever other brain injury that he was going through because leading up to the fight, when you watch his pre-fight interviews, he's talking slowly. Yeah, I mean, that, that what happened to my, Muhammad Ali is indicative of what happens to most of fighters. I mean, I, I happen to know some of them they're not, they're no longer in the limelight, but they're doing these things to make money because that's, that's how they. That, 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 that's what happened. I said, why Muhammad Ali had made millions. You know, yeah. why, why take that fight? And, and Larry was like, yeah, he made millions and he spent millions. He yeah. had an entourage of people that all had their hand out. Right. And uh, then, then I hate to say it like this, but you're getting hit in the head. Yeah. In your job, right? So. There's diminished capacity, and you're making decisions from a diminished capacity. True. So the decision to take more fights is a byproduct of that. Yeah. So it doesn't matter how much money you're making, your, your decision making is faulty, you know? Right. Leading up to that fight, you know, because I really researched it heavily, when they were doing, you know, the pre-fight physicals, they're saying that Muhammad Ali wasn't able to touch his finger to his nose. And then, man, people making money off of this, man. Yeah, they're, and they, they get into the ring, and according to, to Larry in our interview, he was, number one, he was close to Muhammad Ali. He used to be a sparring oh, partner. Yeah, he yeah. traveled with him to all the big fights, the mm -hmm. Thrill of Manila, the Rumble, the Jungle, whatever else. That was his friend, his hero, whatever. He mm -hmm. didn't want to fight him, but, and it was... A bit of a no win because it's like, well, you're right. this old man, but everyone's like, you're not really the champ, even though you're, you know, he ended up being 48 and 0. It's like, oh, you're not fighting Muhammad Ali, who's the real champ. So he took that fight and he said he was literally hitting him with an open hand the whole time. Mm -hmm. He was just slapping him around right. the entire time. And he was saying how he was telling the the ref, like, you gonna stop this fight? Like, you want mm -hmm. me to kill him? Like, and, and the ref told him, shut up and box. Mm hmm. So he had to do it. And he cried after. Yes, yeah, yeah. He literally cried yep, I after, beating, yeah. after beating Ali. Okay, so you fight Muhammad Ali in the ring, and every round you're, you're dominating. And then by the 10th round, uh, Ali's trainer, Angelo Dundee, he stopped the fight 
which was the first time that Ali had ever stopped a fight in his entire career. Well, did you see me, when you watch this replay on there, when, when I walked oh, yeah. back, walk back to my corner, I was walking back to my corner, I doing like this. What do you want to do? Want me to kill the guy, huh? You know, listen, they know, Angelo Dundee knew that I could whoop Muhammad Ali, that he ain't had a chance because I was his sparring partner. I was in there every day with the man. I know how he fought. I know how he, what, if he threw it left, I knew if he threw it right. I know how he blocked his punches. He didn't have none of that. And I said, what I got to do? I don't want to kill the guy, <laughs> but I'm going to beat on him some more, okay? And that's the way it was. And after the fight, I went to his dressing room, and he was there. You said, I want homes, I want homes, I want homes. I said, you don't want me no more, man. You don't want me no more. I get, went to grab him, hugged him, gave him a kiss, and tell him, I said, you'll be the greatest, man. you always be the greatest in my book. Yeah, that's, that's just horrible. I mean, it's, that's, that's like the story of so many people. And, right. and, and, and it, it relates to some other things that we talked about. You have the people who, who admire you and love you and surround you, but you know, very rarely is there someone with the, the um, I guess with the, the status that can affect your decision making. You know, it, it's kind of like they're enablers. So, and part of it is like they're, they're thinking that they're doing the best for you by supporting you. And sometimes that's the worst thing for you. Yeah, yes, man. We talked about this last time. Yeah, yeah of course. You know, and they're, yeah. they're making money off you. And, you know, for example, in the, in the Larry Holmes interview, even with the beating that Ali took mm -hmm. to his, you know, with his former sparring partner, he kept taking fights. And he fought uh, Trevor Burbick. Yeah. And uh, Ali, I mean, sorry, uh, Larry Holmes was saying how Burbick just did him dirty. Just really oh, yeah. just beat him way past the point of him needing to. Yeah, well, it, it, these are fighters. I mean, they don't come from, like, <laughs> their backgrounds. You tend to be a little bit, you know, uh, kind of dysfunctional. So, <laughs> so it's kind of like Burbick. Major issues with that guy. There's a lot of people. Do you know, do you know what happened to Burbick? Do you know how he yeah, died? Yeah. How did he die? Got killed. Got got killed by his uh, was a relative. His nephew. Nephew. Yeah. His nephew beat him with a steel bar. Yeah. Larry Holmes. When I told him, he didn't know about that mm -hmm. that part. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I told him, he goes, he got what he deserved. God don't like ugly. You know, this guy was an <laughs> asshole. You know, Burbick ended up getting murdered by his own nephew. Uh, at 52 years old, some years later. I don't feel bad about, for him. God don't like ugly. They, yeah, yeah, people, yeah. And, and Larry Holmes had fought him, uh, himself also and had a very bad experience with him. Yeah, yeah, but you know, one, one of the things you think about, like when, when I watch fighters, right, sometimes I watch their interviews, and if you notice a connection between the synapses, the way the, pe the, the fighter will speak, all right, that's that's an indication of how fast their brain works sometimes. Where you got Conor McGregor, like sharp as hell, funny as hell, on his feet. All these, uh, the, the, some of the greatest fighters, in an interview, you can see how sharp they are. Uh, that's a major thing, because if your brain is working quick, your, your reactions and everything else, mm -hmm. I don't care what your skill level is, it's got to go through here first. Right. Right? So when you're... When Ali started to speak slower, guess what else is going to happen slower? His boxing. Yeah. yeah. So the, that little razor sharp edge that you had, that's gone. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So, but you can see that in a lot of fighters where you go, what's your name? My name is so and so. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I know I'm not, I'm not going to expect to see really quick reflexes out of that guy. <laughs> right. Before the Larry Holmes interview, mm -hmm. I had a Buster Douglas interview. Uh-huh. Uh, -huh. uh and that was considered the biggest upset in sports history. Absolutely. Not boxing, mm -hmm. not, not, you know, boxing and MMA, sports, period. Right. 42 to one odds. Well, I mean, number one, I actually am old enough to see, actually watch this fight with all my friends uh, on TV. Uh, you know, this was, 
not just the biggest upset in boxing, not just the biggest heavyweight upset, but the biggest upset in sports history. Like I said, you were 42 to one against you winning this fight. And you turn around and you beat the guy that nobody thought was beatable. So it is unbelievably my honor to sit down with you today. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. This is cool. Mm -hmm. The reason why this fight was even in Japan was because no American venue wanted to take it because they felt Buster yeah. Douglas didn't have a chance and it was mm -hmm. a waste of everyone's time. Yeah. And he got in there and knocked Tyson out. Mm -hmm. Fair and square. And uh, we're both old enough to have watched the fight on, on TV. You know, I assume you weren't there. No, I, I, yeah. I wasn't there, yeah. but we all watched it with our friends on TV. And it was like, oh, my God, I can't believe this is happening right, right. now. Right. You know, what's interesting, you know, as I was going through my research with this, is that to this day, like, for example, Mike Tyson had like his uh, one man show on mm -hmm. Broadway. To this day, he still claims that Buster Douglas got a 13 second count and he won that fight. Hmm. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's. I don't know. There, there's. A, the, I didn't really look at that. I think that there was. He might have some validation in that, but of course he didn't win the fight because, you know, it, right. it's if the if the referee doesn't see something or is well, mistaken. Apparently, I mean, I watched the fight very closely mm -hmm. multiple times before the interview. Yes, the, the count may have started a little bit late. Right. But you could clearly see in the footage that Buster was ready to go. Mm -hmm. He was basically waiting for the nine count, and then he got right up. Right. It wasn't like he was staggering and he barely got up. And yeah, I, I do. I do. I he do. Was, he yeah, was ready. He, so if, he's, yeah, it, it could be the referee's fault, but still, it's not Buster Douglas's fault. He's, he's you know, he's clear. I he's do clear. remember that. Right. As you know, I had to recreate the fight. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. I, had to, I played him in that fight. Exactly. Yeah, so. You know, whereas yeah. when you see the Tyson knockout, mm -hmm. by by nine seconds, oh, pff, yeah. Tyson was yeah. trying to find his he's mouth. Trying, he's, yeah, he's reaching for right. the mouth. And that's actually yeah. like Buster, you know, when I asked Buster when he knew it was over, he said when Mike was trying to find his mouth guard, he, saw, he knew that at well, that, that point. Well, that damn combination. My God. <laughs> that that I, mean, I kind of remember that combination. I'm, I'm a fight nerd, mm -hmm. but that damn combination. Wow, the, you know, being at the end of those punches with a guy that big. Yeah, and, and and you know, I mean, I think when you talk to Mike, he can talk about what transpired before that fight and mm -hmm. how. You know, I mean, well, I happen to know a little bit about the non preparedness of of that. Well, uh, according to Bobby Brown. My cousin. That's your cousin? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm finding this out for the first time. <laughs> well, according to Bobby mm. Brown, mm. and there's an interview, I believe, with Questlove about this, and it might have also been in his book. Bobby was in Japan, in Tokyo, at the same time. And the two of them had like 12 girls, like 12 Japanese girls mm -hmm. in the room with them the night before. I had also heard something about cocaine use. I'm not quite sure about that part, but they were basically partying and and having sex with these girls all night. And, and Bobby was like, "Yo, man, you got to fight tomorrow." And Mike's like, "Ah, Bobby, you know, you, you this is gonna be a piece of cake. You worry too much. I'm good." Yeah, yeah. And look what happens. You kind of low key did a Tyson impression. A little but, bit, yeah, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there was, I mean, there was a lot of stuff. You know, there was a lot of stuff he was going through at that time. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, to for him to even function that that well, if you want to call it well, uh that's you know, it's um it's surprising he even functioned that well given what what he was going through. When you saw Tyson get knocked out. Mhm. Mm number one, were you surprised or no? Of course I was surprised. At that yeah. time I didn't know nothing about what was going on underneath. Right. Yeah. Right. You but know. now when you Look at that fight. I personally think Buster got that fair and square. You can't take nothing away from Buster Douglas knocking out Mike Tyson. No, you can't. Uh, I just, th that was a very diminished Mike Tyson and we didn't take that fight seriously. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, that wasn't, 
you know, you could say that wasn't Mike Tyson. If 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 I've got all the skills in the world and I come half half ready, it's right. on me. You remember know? the rubber glove filled with water? What? You don't remember that? A rubber glove glove filled? No. Mike's corner. Oh yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. But they, they didn't have inswell. I, inswell. There we yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. I, I, th- yeah, that come back because I had to say that. <laughs> <laughs> right. We had to do that. Yeah. So yeah. Right. So well, because I, I they never, mean. since Mike would never get hit, mm-hmm. they just, I guess, they didn't even bother to bring the inswell. You know, you know, so they literally took a rubber glove, filled it with cold water, and put it on Mike's face. Yeah. You know. You know. Don <laughs> King really had some thought be- behind hiring Mike's friends as his. You know, it has his his corner people, and which was not a you know not a good thing. But in theory, it's like, oh, if he, I mean, he's going to be hanging with these people anyway. Maybe if he gives them some responsibility, yeah, they can get him to do what he's supposed to do. Right. You know. Well, uh, it didn't we, work though. Me and Larry Holmes talked about this. Uh, Larry Holmes around the time I believe this was a, in a post fight interview or pre fight. I wasn't quite sure, but. Larry Holmes predicted that Mike Tyson would go to prison within five years of their fight. And Mike Tyson went to prison within five years of their fight. And he basically was like, well, you don't have to be a, a super genius to figure this out. You know, a guy, you know, a guy from the hood who has bad people around him that, that's making short term decisions. That's not, you know, saying no to anything and so forth. Yeah, he's going to end up getting caught up. After the fight, you did an interview and they asked you about Tyson and uh, you said, Mike Tyson is going to be a great fighter, but his mind is not going to be there to be a great fighter because he's going to do anything and everything he wants to do. I told people in five years, he would be in jail and everything I predicted and said about Mike Tyson came true. I mean, I like Mike Tyson. I think he's a good guy. I just think he needs to think about what he's going to do before he actually does it. And you were right. Mike Tyson ended up going to prison and, and having a whole bunch of problems. Uh, money that, problems, legal problems. Do that makes me a genius, predicting how he's going to act. Did I predict that he's going to jail? I predicted all of that stuff, man. It don't take no Einstein to know what a guy do that's in the jail, in the ghetto. He's from the ghetto, he's in the Bronx and places like that in New York, places that I go and I'm okay. Don't bother me because I got my mind together pretty much. Mike Tyson. Larry Holmes, who honestly, man, I gained so much respect from him in this fight. Like he really did what he needed to do in the ring. He took his money. He invested it. He's still rich. Lives in a giant mansion. Yeah. Owns tons of of assets. Uh, he's not one of these struggling. You know, Mike right. Tyson burned through three hundred million dollars mm-hmm. and ended up in debt. Yes. Three hundred million. He was talking about, like, in his interview with Jim Jones, how he had, like, a $7 million necklace that he just lost, that someone just stole from him. Yeah. He ended up leaving a million dollars in a, in a duffel bag in the casino because mm. he had a rough night. Like, like this type of shit was happening. Uh, and, yeah, Mike Tyson ended up in prison in five years. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, it's, it's not that much of a surprise. Uh, it's, depending on, I mean, it's, it's, it was a chaotic. Yeah. And Crazy. that's when you guys put out the movie, right? When he was in prison. Yeah, when he was in prison. Yeah. Yep. What about the story of Don King getting beat up by Mike? I, I've heard that. I'm a, I, I don't have any firsthand information about that, but yeah. it's not surprising. Yeah, I guess they were on a, a private jet together, mm. and uh, Mike just started getting angry and angry, and at one point he just kicked Don in the head and just beat the shit out of him. Makes sense to me. <laughs> I mean, well, you know, Mike Tyson... Beating up somebody is not that surprising. <laughs> <laughs> really. Did you see that whole interview with uh, Boosie and Mike Tyson? Yeah, I did. What'd you think? I, I you know, I, it, it was like, you know, I, I, I kind of, I really was studying Mike in, in the, in the, in a way where I just kind of, wow, you know, it's, I really, I really haven't been glimpsing much about his life. My feeling was like, I did the movie, you know, cool. Like we've run into each other several times. We have a lot of mutual friends, but I always feel like, yo, know, I, I was a, I was a guest in your life for a minute. You know, I'm cool. Like, you know, <laughs> that's enough for me. Right. I wish you well. Um, I understand the, the, you know, pugilistic worship. 
I'm not from that. I that's not me. Uh, I I feel like I do know how the world painted him, and psychologically how people. He's a hero to a lot of people mm -hmm. because I mean, early on, they painted him. The media painted him as this kid from the wrong side of the tracks who were was rehabilitated by these kindly white folks. <laughs> the American dream. I, I know that not to be completely true, right? He had some dirt with him, mm -hmm. right? It's not a surprise right now. You think about what, when Robin Givens was like, hey, uh, excuse me, um, all ain't right here. At that time, he was painted as such an innocent that we hated Robin Givens. Yep. Everybody hated Robin Givens. But do they hate her? Now, if... What you know now, if she said, uh, this ain't all, <laughs> you know, wine and roses over here, you'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah, she was right. You didn't well, know it at the time. Well, to be fair, mm -hmm. to be fair, Robin Givens, I think, knew what she was getting into when she married Mike Tyson relatively quickly. There was also the whole thing of her being pregnant and then having a miscarriage. Mm -hmm. Mike felt that that was, whole thing was a lie just so they well, could get the, married. The, 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 I mean, look. The two things can be true. The yes. two things can now, be true. Now, yes. all I'm yeah. saying is, even in 2020, would I say that Robin Givens married Mike so she can get a check afterwards? Mm -hmm. I, I, I would still say yes. Okay, see, but that's, I would still say he, yes. Here's the point. The, the point I'm making is the media did such a great job of painting Mike Tyson to be an innocent that we know, because I know firsthand, I had everything because I had to play him. Mm -hmm. I had to have every interview on Mike Tyson. I knew the, the air date and everything else. Remember, we didn't have 350 channels at that time, mm -hmm. right? And so I recognized and I, and I memorized every interview. And then once he got sent to jail for the rape, they started letting out all these other parts of the interviews when he starts talking about the more violent stuff and how he viewed women and all this other stuff, all the stuff that they hid from the public beforehand. Mm -hmm. Now, nobody knew that stuff. Nobody did. Not Robin, not anyone else, right? At first, everybody, because we love them so much, is because the, the 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 great job that the media did. All I'm saying, all I'm pointing out is just this is interesting how the media painted that, and and once once it um, represented him that way, he's in our hearts in that way. If they had shown the stuff, think about it. when he was in, in jail, that wasn't new footage. When he started talking about, you know, driving, a, you know, the bone, you know, his nose bone up in the brain mm -hmm. and, you know, and saying the part where you, you fornicate with me, then maybe we'll talk. All, all of these other things. I'm just saying I was in a really interesting position where I'm going, oh, my God, none of this. All of this negative shit, that, di that didn't see the light of day until, until he gets with Don King and goes to prison. Now, media is saying, no longer is he the sweet, innocent guy from the wrong side of the tracks who the kindly white people rehabilitated. Now. He's with this black man. He's violent. He feels like this toward women. All the stuff that they edited out start getting played. Think about it. Hmm. There was no new. While he was in prison, do you think there was was new footage of him? Right. Hell there's, no. Yeah, there was no interviews while he's being locked no. up. No, I got you. I, so, see, but, I see where you're going. But, with so this. so th that's all I'm saying. Interesting. Interesting, had that footage been there beforehand, you'd be sitting there going, okay. Hmm. Okay. I I'm not where, surprised, I Robin. see where you're going with this. I see where you're going I'm with this. I'm not surprised with, you know, all I'm saying is like, there's something to learn here. 
there's something that I would want people to reflect, reflect back on and realize the manipulation of how powerful the media is. I'm not saying, you know, oh, this guy's a villain or whatever. If anything's villainous, I'm saying it's the media. This man represented himself. He didn't hide anything f- about himself. Yeah, he was Mike the whole time. It was the media that hid things about him okay. because they had an agenda. Well, the whole interview with Boosie. Mm-hmm. So after the interview came out, Mike uh, did a TMZ interview where he kind of gave a little bit of the backstory on this. Mm-hmm. And, you know, because I kind of, it was a little weird how he started off the interview basically asking Boosie about his comments about gay people and transgenders and, and mm-hmm. Dwayne Wade's, uh, you know, daughter, or son, whatever, um, and so forth. Uh, but what had happened was, the way Mike described it was, when he was getting ready to do the interview, his daughter find out found out that he was interviewing uh, Boosie. And from what it, the way he was saying it, I guess his daughter is gay or maybe just feels extremely strongly about gay rights. Right. She flew out to LA mm. so she could confront Boosie after mm. the interview. So here you have this father mm. whose daughter's already in his ear right, right. about the like, this guy's a homophobe and you better, <laughs> you better, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, talk to him about his gay comments. So mm-hmm. Mike said, okay. And he went straight into the gay comments to right. begin with. And uh, he even asked Boosie if he was gay at one point. All right. And, you know, Boosie, you know, try to hold his own. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, Boosie stands on his ideals. Uh, yeah. You know, but then you got Mike Tyson going at you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you're, that's, that's I'm sure in the dynamic. back of your mind, Boosie's thinking like, you know, <laughs> this could go left right yeah. as, at any point because we're dealing with mike tyson did you ever see how mike uh flashed on tk kirkland no let's play you a clip we can't actually uh I mean, this is his footage so i'm not gonna be able to actually play it for you but just so you have a content yeah <laughs> <laughs> and let me tell you something and, i think that's the fear that a lot of people have with that brother r- right yeah, you know so, yeah. so we, we just we, we, we just watched uh the, the you know I, I showed you the clip of mike tyson tk kirkland mm-hmm. and uh I know TK. He's been mm. on my show a half dozen times. I know uh, TK very well. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. TK wasn't saying anything wrong. He was like, nah. You know, he was just trying to be consoling. And Mike's like, don't tell me how the fuck I will. Yeah, what the hell well, are you my, tell my, me how that life feels? Yeah, well, Mike read it that way. He, he read it as disrespect. That That's one of those things, man. Like, it's, you know, that's it, it's a trigger. Yeah. It's a trigger that can go left, like, real quick. I know it because I've I've always had that trigger. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm in much more control of it, you know. Uh, but yeah, I'm from that, and that's that's sometimes when there are times where, um, like I th- we we had an interview and we talked about the whole Mel Gibson uh, mm-hmm. thing, and I'm like, oh, I have a trigger, guy. I, I have a trigger, and it can things could occur that quick. And even, it's like, even when you're talking to Mike Tyson, there's a, rec, there's a you know, there's a thing where you both, you're both armed. And depending, shit can go left quickly. You know what I mean? It's like, so sometimes you just kind of go, yeah. I love you from a distance. Love you from a distance. Yeah, yeah. you know, so because, you know, <laughs> Every you know, you got that tick tick boom thing, <laughs> right? You know, I, I remember after we put out our Larry Holmes interview, I, I saw yeah. one of the comments because I guess there was one of my one of my viewers lives in the same town as uh-huh. Larry Holmes, and I guess Larry had some restaurants, right? And this guy parked in front of the restaurant, in the place he was supposed to park, and Larry Holmes actually came outside and said, "You park here one more time, I'm going to come out of retirement." <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, man. Hey, you know, Clint East, Eastwood in, in on Warner, Warner Brothers parking lot, you park in his spot, that dude's coming out with a golf club. Really? Yeah, yeah. There's some people got that. You know what I mean? It's, it happens to, there's a certain, I don't, there's a certain um, man code <laughs> that certain folks have. And it's part of what makes them them, you know? Well, did you hear about the Wesley Snipes thing that came out recently? No. Well, uh, there was the rumor 
that while filming Blade Trinity, which mm-hmm. is, you know, Blade Part 3, yeah. that uh, Wesley Snipes ended up choking the director. Yeah, oh, uh, what's that guy's name? Oh, uh, oh, was that Goyer? David Goyer, yes. Oh, I, I, I didn't, I never heard about that. But yeah, I know it, yeah. there was some tension. According to to Patton Oswalt, who was in the film as well, mm. uh, you know, he said that he tried to strangle the director, and then um, Wesley Snipes. So Wesley Snipes actually responded to this. He had an interview with the Guardian. He said, "Let me tell you one thing." If I try to strangle David Goyer, you probably wouldn't be talking to me right now. Black eye with muscle strangling the director of a movie is going to go into jail. I guarantee mm-hmm. you. Yeah, I would think. Yeah, he also I'm, said I'm not, I'm this is the part of the challenges that we as African Americans face here in America. These microaggressions, the presumption that one white guy can make a statement and that statement stands as true. Why would you believe his version of it is true? Because they are predisposed to believing the black guy is always the problem. Yeah, I mean, I'm 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 always going to be honest with things the way I see it, and don't mind if I'm wrong because every time I'm wrong, I, I learn something. But in my assessment of that scenario, what built up to that, there was, um, you know, there there were things that I mean, I've learned a lot from Wesley uh, directly. Okay, so you guys are close. Yeah, man, I look, I call him Big Brother all the time. He, okay. He he contacted me about a week ago, just in in praise of uh, the movie my my wife and I did. I mean, he comes up. What you just happen to not catch him at the house? He comes over for the fights as well. Okay, you know Wesley. You know, I mean, one couple freaked out because Wesley was throwing away some trash, right? And the the, the bag was filled, and he he wrapped the bag up and took it out, and they were like. Was that Wesley Snipes? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> well, what is it? Did it, it? Because the bag was filled. Because, <laughs> hey, you know, you know how it is at my yeah, place. It's, of course, it, it's family, right? Um, I remember coming to, uh, to set uh, to visit. Um, I think a, it was a combination of, man, uh, frustrations. Think about that, Blade Trinity. Damn it, you do you realize what was happening? They basically were trying to take Blade away from him. Blatantly. What do you mean? Okay. Check. Just, just, there was um, uh, Ryan Reynolds and uh, Jessica Biel, I believe, in it. <laughs> they were doing things where it was like, just, there's, there'll be Blade poster, Jessica Biel, Blade. <laughs> okay. Ryan Reynolds, Blade. Man, how this man is responsible for the success of that movie. Hundred percent. They're trying to take the movie away from him and say, "This is Blade." Now, this is just this is just clear stuff that you can do. You can check on it. The 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 mistake I believe. Wesley might have made is that this should be a this should be a chess game and when your emotions I mean it's kind of like that you know <laughs> like Don Corleone is don't let don't let people know what you're thinking you know when he says to Sonny Corleone I think once you become emotional you fall into that trap and um, that frustration, rightly so, gave the excuse for them to, to blame him for the, the demise of the movie. I, I ask everybody, look at, look at, see with your own eyes what was going on. And when you're going, okay, you know, like if I was, <laughs> if I was doing Spawn 2, and they were like, here, here's these other two white folks who are not action people, and we want to start calling it Spawn, right? See, you, see, you got it right there. Yeah, but the, how, do you, post. how do you, you you're going to say, here's Jessica Biel, Blade. Right. Wow. And there was no more Blade wow. movies uh, after that. That was the last Blade movie. They did a TV show with uh, Sticky Fingers, 
Yeah. But that kind of came away. Yeah, but like, come on, that's blatant. Blatant. Yeah. Let me where let, let's go. Let's let's make things um fair. Let's look at the white movie where there's a lead character and then they try to transition it into two other people and call it the same. Rambo. You know, like imagine that. And then you have you know, Carl Weathers, Rambo. <laughs> Think, just let's put. Let's, right. let's, I got you. Yeah, like or somebody who's. Uh, I mean, or Carl uh, Weathers, or, 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 Rocky. Rocky, exactly. Yeah, right. That would be perfect. You don't, you don't see. Yeah, it. You Carl don't Weathers, see it. Rocky. No, I got you. I got you. And so, yeah. The thing is, okay, blatant. Like what? What? <laughs> what? That that that's um. So, but the thing is. To learn from that, and I've learned a great deal, is to go, mm-hmm, okay, I got it. The things that have been said to me, like I've talked about before, well, you would be, too bad you're black. You know, you'd be great for this movie or that. Okay. I see the way you think. I see the way, you, you know, executives think. You're, you think that you can say that to me and that I should be fine. Now, if I get mad at it, uh, and and say something, yeah, I, I become a target. Well, yeah, I'm. This is this is chess, not, not checkers. I've learned that there are ways that, um, and even though it's not super cons- conspiratorial, if you fall into that trap and make yourself a target, they will use you as a target. Yep, I agree. The trick is not to fall for that. Yeah. Well, uh, Sean Connery recently passed away. Yeah. 90 years old. Mm -hmm. Had a hell of a life. Hell of a career. Absolutely. What a real cat, too. You met him? No. No. I met him. Indirectly, uh, his his son directed me in, in a movie. Oh, okay. And, and... Man, I could. I, there was no story that he could tell about his father that bored me. Oh yeah, there was a famous sixty Minutes interview about uh, how Sean admits to beating his wife. Yeah. Well, he man, he said it in front of like Barbara Walters. Barbara Walters. Yeah. Right. I don't, I don't mind smacking a woman if if she deserves it. He goes, well, you know, <laughs> you get to a point where you know you let her have the last word, and she just keeps going at it. You just yeah you just have to hit her. Yeah, man, it's like, yo, I mean, he-, he Unapologetic about it. He represented a, a, I mean, hey, James Bond was smacking a woman around. You know what I mean? Hey, man, listen, he didn't he, have no he, problem he, with he's that. He's a stereotypical yeah. Yeah. Uh, drunk Irish guy. Like, <laughs> Yeah, but hey, he represented yeah. that time. It's an old ass time, but you know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, generally considered uh, the greatest James Bond. Absolutely. And Daniel Craig to me is, you know, acting wise, He's kind of up there, but yeah. But well, Sean I think Connery's just overall the entire package. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and, and I grew up with yeah. Roger Moore mm-hmm. as my James Bond. But mm-hmm. you look back at the the Sean Connery films, you're like, okay, I yeah. got it. The Roger Moore films were better. Yeah, but as a, as far Sean as the James, Connery, yeah, 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 yeah. There was always the talk, you know, in the last couple of years of Idris Elba mm-hmm. becoming James Bond, becoming the first black James Bond. Mm-hmm. Uh Number one, do you ever see that happening? I don't like the idea of that. Be your own thing, man. You don't have to be James. Screw James Bond. <laughs> you know, Idris Elba could be his. I mean, I wish the. I'm like, I was mad that he wasn't wasn't Black Panther. Personally, but I mean, Idris Elba could be. I would rather him be a brand new character that's better than James Bond. You know what I mean? Why not? Well, it's a harder sell, right? Because James Bond is such a franchise. And to step know. into those, But you know, you're going to already, like if you say uh, Idris Elba is James Bond, there's um, there's going to be a reluctance that go. You know, that, right, because yeah, when yeah. James Bond is a fictional character, mm-hmm. but it's based on a set of books by, I think, what Ian Fleming yeah. uh, was the author. And he was a white man in these books. Yeah. So... Certain people are going to have a problem with suddenly 
him being, uh, you know, uh, depicted as a black man. It, uh, yeah, it's going to be an obstacle that's going to be right. that's going to be carried on with the damn. You know, movie. but but you're talking about a fictional character mm-hmm. now. If they if they made, uh, you know, if they did a film about, I don't know, Mike Tyson, and they had uh, Tom Hanks playing him, then I could see how that would be. Ridiculous, but the, yeah, yeah, but, of course, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But well, I'm hey, saying man. it's a fictional character, so it's yeah. I mean, it's uh, funny you know, because I. They they are doing things like that because there's a there's a movie called Ar- uh, Lupin, mm-hmm. very famous. Lupin the Third. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Arsen- Japanese, Japanese manga. Yeah. No, 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 no. It's this this, oh, this Fr- Lupin? French. Um, Arsene Lupin. It's it's kind of like a oh he's sorry a, he's a gentleman burglar. Yeah, uh, L- Lupin. L- Lupin is a yeah. It's it's a Japanese cartoon. Is it? Yeah, he's a thief. Yeah, he's a thief. Yeah, I know exactly who you're talking about. But, Tall, skinny guy with black hair. It's a book. It was from a book. Well, originally it was a comic book, and it turned into a cartoon. Okay, yeah, but it was a, a, a book from a long time. It's a, well, anyway, it was famously always this white character. Now, this guy right here. No. That's not the loop you're talking about? Is, how do you spell it? L-U-P-I-N. Yeah, but if you put 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 in uh, ar- Arsen Lupin. Ar- 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 Arsen? Yeah. Ar- how do you spell that? A R S A N N E, L U P I N. They're uh, old novels, like this. This is like a Sherlock Holmes type of thing. This guy right here. Yes. Okay. You know that that should date way back. Yeah, you're right. Okay, different guy. Yeah. Although I think that that Lupin was based on this other Lupin. Maybe, but uh, Netflix has put a lot of money in it. They've they've got they've um they have a series that they shot in, in French. It's a, it's a French series, okay. Um, uh, where the that Lupin character is black. I know because I'm 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 doing the voice of that character for the American version. Ah, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. So there there are things that are happening that way, but I think um, with James Bond, it's such a big, that's such a big character. Yeah, like. Trying to make Wolverine black it would be a tough sell. Mm. Possibly, yeah. You know, I think there's some characters that you can make black, and, but but it's like uh, I just I, I I I the gesture of it shouldn't be so blatant. You know what I mean? Because it becomes an obstacle. Uh, yeah. I mean, listen, it's, yeah, it's, it's like one of these things Superman where you, can, you can argue for the rest yeah, of your life. Yeah. These are all fictional characters. They decide to, you know, this actor just embodies the person a lot better than any mm. other actor they could find. So they're going to go that way. I don't know. I mean, mm. Hugh Jackman killed it as Wolverine. You know, clearly with the yeah. number of movies they had him do as that character. Yeah. So, you know, who knows? Who knows? Well, speaking of actors, I recently interviewed Leon. Leon, yeah, okay. Very dope interview. I was a big fan. That's good. Um... Five Heartbeats was one of my favorite movies, mm. really, period. Mm. Just a brilliant piece of a, a cinema. And, you know, with, you know, a typical Vlad TV interview, if you have some connection to Tupac, I'm going to talk about it. So <laughs> okay. we talked about how uh, they did Above the Rim together, mm. right? And they talked about, you know, how on set uh, Tupac was perfect, knew his lines, showed up on time, everything else like that. But once... He was offset. It was just total chaos. Mm. Uh, getting into fights with people, uh, giving blunts to the audience members, and then there was the Atlanta shooting that happened yeah. right around, like literally during the shooting, mm-hmm. you know, of the film. He shot two uh, white cops in Atlanta, right, and then had to go through. You know, they said that they had to just. You know, they're okay. We're not shooting that scene today because Tupac <laughs> is locked up and right, you know right. and so forth. But what he told me was very interesting. Uh, at the end uh, of their relationship. And that is, Leon sat right behind Tupac at the Tyson-Selden fight. Mm. Which was, you know, which shortly after Tupac got killed, Mm -hmm. right, in Las Vegas. And when I asked him how Tupac was and what ended up being some of his last moments uh, on Earth, I said, how was he at the fight? He told me something very interesting. He said the entire fight, Tupac was screaming because, you know, him and 
you know, Pac and, and uh, Mike Tyson were close. Mm -hmm. He said the whole time Pac was screaming at the at the at the ref, jumping up and down, acting unruly. He said it was even to the point where the ref, I think, had to tell Pac to calm down because yeah. he was he was basically interfering with the fight. Mm -hmm. And he even talked about how Pac kind of carried that same energy into the lobby where he ended up, you know, attacking Orlando. Right. Orlando Anderson. You were actually sitting next to him at the Mike Tyson fight at the MGM mm -hmm. in 1996. Yeah, he was sitting just a uh, row behind me. Okay, so you you reached back to him and, and talked to him. And oh so yeah, forth? no, yeah, definitely, yeah, definitely. You know, say what's up and you know whatever. Yeah, of course. Yeah. What was the vibe like in terms of him? Like, you know, because he obviously did not know what was about to happen. Um, you know, be honest with you, man, he was, <laughs> he was beyond rambunctious. I mean, he was yelling at the, at the referee to the point where the referee could hear him. He was calling the other guy a bum. It was like, it was, he was going off. I mean, he had a lot of energy that night. And so I guess whatever happened spilled out into the lobby. And, um, and then from there, you know, I remember we were all out and we got the news, and, you know, that was rough. And it just kind of makes you think, you know, look, I go to fight parties at your house. Mm -hmm. And I don't think anyone in that room who's a man doesn't feel somewhat pumped up from watching these two men beat each other. And, you know, you you put yourself into, you know, you kind of, you know, as a man, you project yourself to a certain degree into these guys who are fighting each other. And you kind of feel like that's you a little bit. Mm -hmm. And you get hyped up and pumped up. And it just kind of got me thinking of like, if Pac had just been chilling in his room and he went downstairs and saw Orlando after not seeing Tyson fight and get all riled up and full of testosterone, if none of that would have happened. Yeah, you know, it's just like, like I say, my my assessment of who he was, uh, I feel like I, I've gotten a glimpse at something that other people who knew him they, they all agree with me, and, and the people that that were there all agree as well. Uh, but it's something intoxicating about being this character and, you know, kind of living on id, you know, like there's the id, the ego, and mm -hmm. but just, so I know what that intoxication is from acting and being, you know, kind of in, inhabiting a character. I mean, I think to some degree, imagine, I can imagine Drake going crazy into another <laughs> direction. I mean, he can he can go from, you know, one thing to, I mean, not maybe total gangster, but if you're looking at somebody that says, okay, well, there's this side of me, but then I can drift into this side to some degree. Mm -hmm. Imagine him just keep going with that. And it meaning so much that he just in, 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 encompasses the street persona, like 24-7, or not, or not 24-7, but around that group. And somebody who he really isn't, but he can just kind of go off that way. Like when yeah. you're acting, when you're, that, that, there's a, there's a, um, there is a concept when you are acting and you're playing a character, like if I'm playing Black Dynamite, I'm playing a character <laughs> That it's like it's fun to just go off and be somebody else right. for a minute, right? Yeah. Like I, I remember in my interview with Leon, because he played uh, Little Richard, yeah, right in the, in the biopic, yeah. And at one point, Little Richard was on set, mm -hmm. and he talked about how he got Little Richard kicked off set. Because he said there cannot be two little Richards in this room right now. <laughs> I am little Richard right now. I can't be looking at the other little Richard. <laughs> right, right. Get him the hell up out of here. <laughs> yeah. And you know, little Richard was still alive uh, during the time that you were filming this. And I guess at one point, little Richard was on set while you're working, and you actually had to kick little Richard off because you said there could only be one little Richard at a time. Yeah, I mean, he was in my line of sight, you know, when I was doing a scene, when I was about to do a scene, I'm like, I can't do that, you know? I can't be Little Richard and Little Richard be there. I mean, there's only one Little Richard on set. So he understood, he was cool. He knew my dedication to it, so, yeah. 
Yeah. That's <laughs> acting for you. But, bro, there's an intoxication with that. Yeah. You know, in st- you know, being a character. A- a- Andrew, Silver- a- Andrew Silverstein. Mm-hmm. Andrew Dice Clay. Yeah. That was one of the characters that he had. He used to do impressions like crazy. That character. Stuck. Stuck. And yep. kind of became. Him. <laughs> yeah, him. Yeah. Uh, but it. There's there's so many cases of this if you pay attention. You you could play a, a role and that alter ego is far more interesting than who you normally are. So you know, me and me and Mob James uh, mm. had an interview about this yesterday. Yeah. We were talking about it. Like everyone knew who Orlando was. Mm-hmm. This guy was a hitter. Yeah. This guy was being investigated for multiple murders. He was a shooter. This was not a soft guy. Yeah. Pac had no business running up and punching this guy. Mm-hmm. None at all. Not him. Maybe one of one of the death row guys, one of the Bob Piru guys might have taken upon themselves. But even they wouldn't have done that. Not yeah. in the middle of a fucking MGM, you know, Mike Tyson post fight, you know, everything's packed. Uh Suge Knight is still is on probation. Uh, they're they're in a fucking war with bad boys. There's an boy. understanding. There's a street H- hundreds of millions of, of yeah. dollars are being made. You know, and, and I remember like watching the the Suge Knight uh, documentary, uh, American uh, Nightmare, with uh, mm-hmm. Anta, Antoine Fuqua did. And Suge said right after the fight, he looked at Pac and said, "Okay, you know, you're you're hot, you're hot in music right now. Now you're gonna be hot in the streets." Mm-hmm. And that lasted all of what maybe two hours until he got killed. Yeah, being hot in the streets uh-huh. because those guys went and got some guns and retaliated. Instantly. Yeah, because that's because that's what they do. This is this is what they do for a living. Right. Pac does movies and and and, and raps for a living. These guys actually mm-hmm. go and shoot people for a living, and that's all they do morning till night. Yeah. yeah. So and yeah and yeah, I I grew up with those type of people. I knew I know the predator mindset. I know I grew up with that, and so. You recognize it, like from across the room, and the weirdest thing, like I told you before, is that I'm embraced by those people because they they rely on their instinct, and they can check you for a second and go, "No, nah, he's he's from he's from, you know, he, he's a veteran," so they can they can tell that. I can tell that when I even see it, you know. Yeah, I remember. Uh- reading a, a an interview recently with Will Smith and uh they were at the BET awards mm-hmm. and uh Will saw Michael Jackson for the first time and he was like oh I I want to I got to meet this guy but Mike had a bunch of people around him and then sure enough Shug Knight was there and got into some altercation in the middle of the BET awards mm-hmm. so Will Smith's security grabbed him and threw him in like a, a janitor closet, mm. you know, to just separate him from whatever potential shootout or uh, ruckus was about to happen. And as he's looking around the janitor closet, Michael Jackson's in the same janitor closet as him, right? So they start talking. And in the conversation- I never heard this, that's hilarious. Yeah, and in the conversation, <laughs> they start talking about Suge Knight and they both agreed that he caused a lot of trouble. Oh, Michael Jackson God. said, Suge just can't figure out how to be happy. Mm. Just can't figure it out. All the the millions of dollars, the accolades, the fact that you built this company out of nothing. Death mm-hmm. Row was just an idea in your head, and you somehow managed to finagle your way to partner with the greatest hip hop producer of all time. And you guys go and get some of the greatest hip hop artists ever on the label, and then then you get Tupac mm-hmm. on top of that. Like yeah. you're, you're just you have everything going for you. There is no reason why you need to do anything to jeopardize this bag of money that's coming every day. Like look at, for example, TDE. You know, these guys, you know, the you know, top from, you know, who heads TDE is a, is a blood. You know, he comes from that same environment. You never hear anything going wrong with TDE. You never hear of people getting beat up. You never hear of shootings. You never hear of any. No one's gotten killed on that label. Mm-hmm. Uh, you you really just it's it's run like a professional organization because they have Kendrick and they know the you know 
You think that someone let Kendra go and punch somebody? You think that they let Kendra go punch Drake or, or something when mm. they were beefing? Like, fuck out of here. Like, this yeah. is this is our golden goose. Mm. This guy's going to be protected at all costs. Yeah. Not going to let yeah, him but, punch but, somebody? Like, yeah, so, I mean, but that wasn't part of his brand, you know? So if this is part of your brand is violence and everything else and you're trying to walk the walk, you know, that that's that's what's happening. And I feel like, hey... If there's something deep down inside you, you feel like you're unworthy of it, you're going to sabotage yourself. Yeah. You are going to sabotage yourself because you don't feel that you're worthy of success. That, that, that goes for a lot of folks out there. Yeah. If you really deep down don't think you're worthy of happiness, you're not going to have it. You will sabotage yourself every way you can. Yeah. I remember when I interviewed uh, Jamel Hill mm. and she said that the reason why she thinks so many professional athletes go broke is there's a certain level of survivor's remorse, remorse where they grew up in this environment where everyone's broke, no one has anything, and they just won the genetic lottery ticket. This is the hard part for black athletes um, is that they are really stuck between two worlds. It's the world they came with, it's the world they came from who these are the people for them that have held them down when they didn't have the ability to pay dinner for everybody. They feel a twisted sense of loyalty to them. These are also the people who, if they tried to create some distance, would tell them, oh, you've changed. Oh, you're not the same person. Yeah. So many of us feel, we feel a lot of pressure to stay connected. And that's not to say that everybody that you came up with that you have to immediately distance yourself from. That's not what I mean. It's just that you're gonna have people that are in your life who really are only there for what you can give them. And you gotta weed those people out. Even if it means to other people, it looks like you're turning your back on folks. Because regardless of how they may have supported you, um, you're the one with the talent. You're the one with the most to lose, not them. Mm -hmm. You know, because most times, most professional athletes were like superstars from like six, seven years old. Like it was very clear what was about to happen. Yes, you, you, you can pick out certain people that were that just worked so hard that they just got to these stellar levels. But in general, these guys were already superstars and, you know, yeah. elementary school, junior high. They were just born a certain type of way. Like, look at, you know, John Bones Jones, like, look at him. Like yeah. look at the way his body is built. Like you can't you can't train yourself into that. Right. You know, uh when you look at the, you know, Michael Phelps, yeah. he's just a mutant. Yeah. Obscenely large hands, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like gigantic arms, huge wingspan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's gonna win all these gold medals. Mm -hmm. You can't train yourself to be a Michael Phelps. Right. You have to already be born that way and then train on top of that. So these guys grow up in these environments. They get all this money and they almost feel bad. So they go and fuck it all up. Uh, yeah, because you know? there's, there's a truth that, that they have to be faced with. The truth is you're not better than someone else just because you had these accolades. And um, if you are living in an untruth, the truth is going to hit you in the face. Hmm. Okay, you've got all these people telling you you're wonderful because that's kind of how they're conditioned to behave, well, you're not living in the truth. So it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a time where it's gonna hit you when you, you know when you've kind of built yourself up to believe oh, the the world that you you created around yourself. Yeah, yeah, and then the, the rug gets pulled out, and it's like you're faced with who you really are. Yeah, I mean, for example, like look at Takashi right now. Uh, he's been completely silent for like a month. No social media posts, whatever else. You know, he went, he was like the hottest thing smoking, you know, two years ago. Then he gets locked up, tells on everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Hands out almost 100 years, gets out and went right back to what he was doing, but it didn't work out this time around. Yeah. You know, the albums didn't sell. They found out the views were fake. He tried to finagle the system. It didn't work. No one really listened to the music. 
Mm. And now he just have to realize, well, he's probably just a has been it's so artist sad. who snitch on everyone who, you know, the money's dwindling. He may not be able to afford all that fancy security anymore. All of this stuff, all of this trappings of fame and all that stuff and the, the material stuff, that's just basically the devil, basically. Because <laughs> if you if you believe that that makes your life better, oh my God, you're, you're in for a really uh, a rude awakening. It's this fame stuff and making you think that, okay, because you're on this screen, you're better than someone else. Every ounce that you believe in that, you're going to pay for. Right. That's gonna it's gonna be measured in your misery. Yeah, and, and it's it's like I remember this. Uh, it was like a little documentary I saw a long time ago, where some of the the first the first people who were like reality stars on American Bandstand, right? mm, way okay. back in the day. All right. Well, they're dancing basically for free. Yeah. On TV, and they become a big deal. They're their uh, their peers are going on to college and becoming doctors and whatever, but they are dancing on TV till that runs out, right? They're big deals in the town. And now, then after that, then they're opening, they're like showing up at a car dealership openings or whatever. <laughs> and while everyone else has gone on and have productive lives, they come back, hey, you're so-and-so. Yes, would you like some mustard with your... So so this is like, if you look at that, it's like, yeah. that's a microcosm of what's gone on. You think about a lifespan. You want your life to continue to go this way. Yeah. Uh, learning, you know, providing for your family, all that type of stuff. Just because you're like, you're famous for a little bit. If you're famous for 10 years, you are way ahead of the curve. There, there was a, you know... Uh, a an ESPN uh, 30 for 30 that I was watching. I think it was Broke? Broke. Yeah. Yeah. Because I actually yeah. interviewed Andre Risen. Yeah. We talked about that. So I'm watching this, and Tony Dungy is just one of the people that they interview about this. Not because he was, he was broke, but he was just commenting on it. He said, when it comes to sports, professional sports, and you could, you could really expand this to entertainment in general. Mm. You don't have a career. You have an opportunity. Yes. That's, that's, that's brilliant. Brilliant. Yes. When I heard that, I'm like, wow. That's that's it. He man. nailed it. That, that, you have an opportunity which could end at any moment. Absolutely. That's one that's injury and it's over. Mm -hmm. The team decides to trade you and no one else wants to pick you up. It's over. You could try to go overseas, whatever else. Mm -hmm. You don't get any movie roles. It's over. Yeah. You can't make another hit song. It mm -hmm. is over. You have an opportunity. And yeah. during that time, you need to prepare for when that opportunity is over. Because it right. will be over at some point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, You're going to spend most of your time not being celebrated <laughs> in your life. <laughs> right. Yeah, I remember a long time ago, uh, with my, my son, who's now 30, <laughs> I, I pointed to him because he was kind of enthralled with the acting thing or whatever. And I said, you know, let me... Let me do some, uh, you know, some experiments with you. Like I remember, we were visiting my mother, and she doesn't throw anything away. There was old jet magazines and all that type of stuff. Some of them I was on, I was in whatever. But you were on the cover of Jet. At one no, point? no, no, no. I, I, no, I was in in or in out jet. or whatever. Okay. I don't I know you. if I I don't even know if I've done a cover. I don't even collect these things these things. But um, you know, there there were in the in the back of the Jet magazines, there were always the the. The people who were on television, you know, like like the like so these are old jet magazines for 10, 10 years ago. And I said, look at all of the significant, because they always put all the black actors that were currently mm -hmm. on television at that time. Go through jet magazine after jet magazine. Where's this person? Where's this person? Where's this person? Let's think about it. It's it's very rare. We we will see the Morris Chestnuts who's been around for a long time, but for every Morris Chestnut, there are a hundred of other ones that, oh yeah, I remember him from that movie and where is he? Still trying to trying to get to that that spot. Now, now, now right now I'm thinking, hmm, I just mentioned Morris Chestnut. 
Is Vlad going to? Are you going to make a heading that I said something about? Morrison? No, no, no. I'm not. I'm not going to do. I'm, I'm not going to do that. Because yeah. like, you know, I, I got to mess with you a little bit <laughs> because like I, I got to get you on this one. The thing with with the Jamie Fox, when the Jamie Fox, you <laughs> you put a, or somebody, one of y'all put a heading up saying that I don't think Jamie Fox can do the Mike Tyson thing. Right. Or, well, or, which which you said he couldn't. No, I didn't. I didn't say well, that. Well, you said that that you know that picture. There's a lot of lighting and stuff like that. He's not really big enough to really portray but I'm, uh, a I Mike was, Tyson. He's I, a skinny guy. I don't know, but I he was the most fam- one one of the most talented people on the planet. I never said he couldn't perform that. I'll say it would be difficult for him to get get heavy enough to do that. But anyway, <laughs> I just I just mess with the title you. is Michael Jai White who played Mike Tyson doesn't think Jamie Foxx can. Right. Which is pretty much what you said. Don't, no, I didn't say that. Please look at that again. Please look at that. Just, I got a mess with you on that I got a mess with you on that one. Because I, 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 ne- I never said he if couldn't. We, if we get something wrong, I, I want to I wanna address it. Okay. Let's, let's play it. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> okay. Hold on. Hold on. Can he physically look like a Mike Tyson? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, and, 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 and you know, and I got to think like, is it worth it? Like, that's a that's a major health issue. That's a major you undertaking. Gotta, uh, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, uh, some people don't realize that they don't really think about what what you have to do. Okay, I never said he couldn't do it. <laughs> uh, but you didn't really say that he could. No, I did. I said that's a talented cat. It's a talented cat. And God bless uh, him. All right, maybe maybe may, we took may, a little may, bit of. Maybe all right, all right, maybe I'll, there is a, 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 a way uh, you I'll know present, you. presentation right, well, of the Mike Tyson. That I, there's nothing but positive, but, but I just laugh about. It. I go, okay, maybe that's clickbait, but I never said Jamie Foxx couldn't well, do it. Well, you definitely were very uh, unsure that he. I could was pull more it positive of, of him doing it than not. I didn't say anything negative. All right, I was I'll saying, give you I'll that. Okay, fine. fine. I'll, I'll take. I'll, I'll take the blame for that. One. <laughs> Well, I pick I mean, the titles. But, yeah, but I, hey, I don't, you know, I don't even. You're not tripping. But, you know, you know, I don't, I don't trip at all. But I'm like, yeah. hey, you know, I mean, that's the, that's next the first time, thing I laughed at. I never said that well, about listen, Jamie. We, we talk in real life, so next time, just call me. You know, if no, you, no, you no, 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 no. This is wrong. business. Yeah, I, I don't, I, I don't, I leave it up to people. If somebody's going to read that and go, oh, fuck Mike, Michael Jai White, he's <laughs> saying that he could, and, and without watching the the clip. Screw them. You know, if you want to make a, you want an excuse to dislike me, fucking dislike me. I don't care. Uh, fact is, you know, I never said anything about Jamie it, disparaging. In fact, I think he's one of you know, the most talented people alive. Yeah. So, so you know, but that's that's the way it is. I don't, I don't even mind. I mean, I'm just, I'm just messing with you. I don't even mind because if, you know, a lot of people. I mean, it, it, this is all like learning stuff for, for me because uh, it just shows that. People will go with the heading before really researching themselves because yeah. they want to hate. If they want to hate, let them hate. Whatever. Yeah. Well, uh, just recently, uh, Miguel Nunez, uh, who played Juana Man, was caught stealing groceries at like a local Ralph's supermarket. And uh, when I talked to Doug Williams about it, I guess they're doing something together. Mm. He said, oh, yeah, I talked to him about that. He explained uh, the story. And I said, what's what's the story? He goes, well, what he said was he was at the grocery store and the lines were so long and he was kind of in a hurry. So he just uh, just walked out the grocery store with mm-hmm. the groceries. But then he came back the next day uh, to pay him back and then they arrested him. Speaking of Joanna Mann, uh, Miguel A. Nunez Jr., who played the lead role a few right. months ago, was arrested for stealing groceries at a Ralph's supermarket in L.A. So We just did a pilot together, and I spoke to him about that. And oh, really? I, we just did a pilot together about three weeks ago. And according to him, the line was so long. I'm giving you his version of what he had said happened. The line was so long, he just did not feel like waiting in line for it. So he took the, uh, the groceries, went home, and he came back the next day when the line wasn't as long. And he tried to pay for the groceries, and that's when the, 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 the problem arose that they, the, the lady said that he left with the grocers and the, and the police got involved. 
How about just not walking out with the groceries? <laughs> How about just getting back in your car and going to a different grocery store? <laughs> that is the most ridiculous explanation I've ever heard. Hey, I'm sorry, that, Miguel. That, you get mad at me. That's his story. That's the story. so told. long, so hey, Miguel, I just stole the groceries. Miguel, yeah, I tried to defend you here. Whether he believed him, I Come told him on, what you told cut me. Cut it out. <laughs> We'll leave so it you for just America. left with the groceries because the line was too long. We'll leave it to America to decide which one you want to believe. You could have just like hand 50 bucks to the, like, hey, to the cashier. Hey, this is a little more than, here you go. <laughs> or maybe. He sure was hungry, huh? <laughs> and I'm like, that sounds like such a bullshit story <laughs> from the bottom of my heart. Like, <laughs> The line was too long, so I walked out with the groceries. Oh, okay. All right. I'm going to believe that. I don't believe that. How about you just walk? The line is too long, so you just walk out without the groceries. Mm. Go to a different grocery <laughs> store. How, how's that? How's that for a different version of it? Right, but, right. So it just goes to show you have a guy that starred in a, you know, it wasn't the biggest movie in the world, but it was a theatrical release. Mm. That's now stealing groceries in LA. Bruh, there's so many. There's so much of this. I... I have so many peers who were just acting. I wouldn't be in this business if it wasn't for my 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 goal was to write, produce, direct. If it was just acting, I would not be in this business because this this business does not does not support talent. It supports heat, hmm. and I don't care how talented you are. Of course, your talent grows with, with your knowledge, right? In most jobs, the more talented you are, the more, the more gifts you're given, opportunities you're given. Not so with this. You could be the greatest actor in the world and your movie not do bad, and you're just like, you're, you go back to the beginning of the line. Uh, there's so many tragedies. I remember and I'm gonna try not to call out any names, but I was going to do a movie and they they basically uh, needed to hire somebody to play my father. It was an action movie. Uh, this movie didn't happen, but they the, the casting directors were trying to go through names who would play a good father fig- figure to me. And there were iconic names that came up and the casting director were like, who's that? I'm like, you don't know who this is? And I, I ran down a bunch of names and this is a young casting director who doesn't know who these amazing actors were. And I was like a little pissed off. I was more pissed off when I came back during auditions and there were these iconic black men waiting in this room as if they just started acting. And man, it broke my heart. And I apologized to them. They said, Mike, you I, hey, we understand. But I'm like, you guys are royalty. You shouldn't be, you should, you should have appointments separate. They should treat you with the respect you deserve. It was like a casting call, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. That taught me a, a great deal um, to not only be somebody who, on, on this side of the, the camera, but on the other side. The, the mistake our generation before us made was not enough on the other side of the camera or understanding the business. It's, bit, it's called show business for a reason. Adrian Broner is currently in jail. Mm. For a contempt of court. Mm. Do you know the story? No, I, no, not at all. So, so what happened was, and I actually interviewed Adrian mm-hmm. uh, recently. Great guy. He's done a few interviews with us. Yeah, you, I'm with not him. a fan of that guy. No, <laughs> no, no. Why not? Oh man, nah. Just, well, uh, what do you dislike about Adrian Brown? The, the attitude, the arrogance. Um, okay, I can see that. Yeah, I, 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 I was not a fan of that guy. Uh, just. What about him in the ring? Do you, no, you, no. You, you I mean, like I mean really? yeah, he had skill. He's had so certain skills, but I mean, he he. It's like he was kind of trying to position himself like he was next Floyd. Yeah, and I feel like he did some things that was disrespectful to, to Floyd. 
But like, uh, I, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't a fan of his. I didn't. I I rooted for the other guy because I hated. I, I don't like. Okay. I don't like arrogance. Well, what had happened was he was uh, in a nightclub in Vegas, mm. and he had like a backpack full of money. Listen, I got a book bag, right? I had a book bag on. It had like two hundred and seventy some thousand in it, right? I put it down. I turned. No, I think I gave it to J. Craw. I got J. Craw with me. And I turn and it's gone. The waitress is gone, the bag is gone. But I didn't know that one of my friends was playing and they got the bag. So I chased down the waitress like, and I didn't choke her. I just, just held her. I held, I held, I stopped her from walking past me. I'm like, where that book bag at? Where the fuck that book bag at? And it went from there, but I wasn't trying to strangle no lady. Like, I, was, I still can't get in dreads. I am so sorry. Dreads, can y'all please let me back in? That's why I don't like Vegas, because I can't get in dreads. Can y'all please let me back in? I am sorry. Public announcement. I'm sorry. To the lady, I apologize. I was wrong. Can we get past this? Because every time I go there, her husband worked there. He cusses me out. I don't even know if they still together. Like, please, let me back in Julius. I mean, yeah. If you have a bag with a quarter million dollars in it and suddenly it's gone, I can see how most people just freak out and be like, yo, and start looking around and be like, yo, who, who got my quarter million right now? Yeah, it was crazy. And then she like, kind of freaked out and said that, you know, he grabbed me, he gets kicked out, you know, he gets permanently banned out of, I think it was Dre's nightclub in mm -hmm. Vegas. And then she presses, uh, well, she files a civil suit against him. I don't know whether there was a criminal suit or not, but there was a civil suit. He either loses the suit or he just doesn't show up to court and it's a default judgment. But he owes like $800,000, mm -hmm. right? He told the judge that he only had thirteen dollars to his name, but then there's an Instagram video of him, like, you know, I mean, like, flossing, yeah, pulling out, you know, whatever, thousands of dollars, whatever else. Not surprised. So the judge, That's the reason why I don't really care for that cat. The, the judge basically said, "Okay, you're claiming you're broke, but here you are with all this money." He's like, oh no, it's my friend's money. I'm mm -hmm. still broke. Contempt of court, thrown in jail. Uh, that's karma. No, 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 no tears that you're shedding right Hell now. Hell no. Hell no. That to me, <laughs> that to me presents something that, okay, well, he's got the opportunity, opportunity keyword to become better. He, he can go, man, was I an asshole at that, at that point in time? Now I'm focused and I've changed my life to where I will become a fan of someone who learns from their mistakes. But to me, this is the way it was kind of designed, you know? This cat is, he got too big, you know, his, his arrogance exceeded his talent and it put him to where he is. Had he been, I feel like, had he been a little bit more humble and learned from, the, you know, his mistakes, he wouldn't be in this situation, you know? Yeah, it's a shame. Uh, I mean, I, I, I've interviewed the guy, so I like the guy. I have nothing bad to say about him. Yeah, he's he's arrogant, and, uh, you know, I think a lot of boxers are, though. A lot of fighters are, to a certain degree. I think you have to have that level of I'm the best uh, in order to do the job that you're doing. Yeah, you don't have to do the things that, I mean, because, you know, he, 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 he kind of stepped over. He, he, he does the most. I mean, yeah, I'm, not, I'm, not gonna, I'm not sitting here saying that he doesn't. Yeah. Um, you know, but... You know, like we talked about in the interview, uh, is grabbing a woman who's walking off with your bag of money worth $800,000? Like, is that the type of damage that you did to that person that $800,000 will make true. her whole again? I mean, really? Well, 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 did true, you break true. her arm? Right, did you, can, can Can she no longer work? Or did you just shake her up a little bit? Because, yeah, it, was I, a mis because it was a misunderstanding. I, I guess. And you probably don't want to grab people's things and move them because they're not your things. You could have said, hey, whose bag is this? 
these things could be these things could be true. We don't. I don't know how it was how it was done. Listen, too. all you I'm know? saying is, yeah. as someone who's gone through lawsuits himself and had to settle lawsuits and 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 been on both sides of lawsuits, like you are a target when you have a certain amount of money. If this was, you know, Adrian Broner's sparring partner, nothing would have happened. Honestly, maybe. he may have gotten kicked out of the club, and that's it. Maybe, but that's say, that's to say that this woman knows who he is. Of course, or maybe, maybe. But you know, Adrian Broner now, and I mean, it's not like I mean, he's not a household name. No, but to to say, I mean, of course, I'm going blind here, but just for the sake of argument, you got to grab somebody who's a waitress, or you say, "Excuse me, excuse me, uh, you that's my bag." Yeah. All right. I know. I know myself. I got the, I ain't, I ain't grabbing nobody. Right. I ain't grabbing nobody. You yeah. got my money. It's not like you're going to vanish in the thin air. Excuse me, can you stop? <laughs> Whatever. Uh, that person is not going to get away. Right. You know what I mean? So I look at it like that too. Yeah. And the way he might have grabbed her or whatever, who knows? You know what I'm saying? I know you ain't grabbing nobody. No. No, I'm not. So there's a, I mean, some of it's part and parcel to yeah, no, the way certain, certain certain people behave. There, as a gentleman, I'm not grabbing a woman like that. No, I got you. Uh, Dr. Dre's in the middle of a very messy divorce. Man, yeah. You, you've met Dre before, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Several times, man. I've been, what about- uh, what Been about around Dre, his... his house, and just, we were pretty tight at one time. Really? Hell yeah. Hell How nice yeah. is his house? Oh man, I mean that was that was ten years ago. I don't know what it's like now. <laughs> that was, that was but, the pre billion like dollar Dre. Yeah. Man, Dre was just so, such a cool. I know, you know, it's like I knew the guy guy from the gym basically. Oh, we, right, yeah, he would go to the gym with his bodyguards. I heard they, they were like surround him with his friends. Out. I mean, which were cool cats too, man. We used to go to Gold's Gym way back in the way. It was like twenty years ago, and um, oh yeah, it was it was way back when, and. It was one of those things where we just we acknowledge each other. He didn't know me from Jack. I was I I never had done anything that he had seen, but it was just a mutual respect, right? Mm -hmm. And we'd always speak before I left the gym. I'd speak to his, you know, it was like you know, a, you know, an alpha male thing. Like, what's up, man? I see you. What's up, brother? That kind of thing. I go about my business. The the Tyson movie comes out. He sees me in the gym. And go, oh shit, man. I didn't know you was an actor. I'm like, yeah, well, you know, that's, and so it was a total respect thing. And it was like, man, you know, like, like, let's, let's kick it. Like, and he would invite me to things. And I mean, the first thing he invited me to, I mean, you know, I don't know if he has a, I mean, of course I have a vivid memory of this because I mean, it was a, it was a big party over his, his, um, his lawyer's house. Uh, some, Fine girl, lawyer, woman, lawyer. She had a big house in um, in uh, Hancock Park area, and I got there, and it was just so family kind of. It was like a real party. It was a, it was huge. They had this big tent and everything else. I saw Dre with some people talking, you know, from a distance. I wasn't going to approach him, but he sees me and he's like, "Yo, yo, yo," and it's like, and he introduces me to his mom and his. I'm like, hey, hey, this is Mike. I was, I was like, damn, really? And it's just everything about the cat. It was like nothing about this whole. I thought, oh, it's gonna be butt naked women all over the place. No, no <laughs> nothing like that. And then I go to a party at his house. Kid you not, I walk in. Somebody sticks a sticker on my back and says, "You have the name of a a, a famous person on your back. You have to guess." It was some like I'm part of this game and stuff. And I'm like. And I'm like, what? And it's like a really nice house, and there are people passing balloons through their knees on the on the lawn. I mean, this is like this is Mayberry. <laughs> I, was, I was expecting Dr. Dre, and this is like nothing but, you know, butt naked poker. I don't, I I didn't know what to expect, but it was just nothing but family, and it's always been that way. Yeah, well, uh -huh. it's not that way right now because Nicole Young. Yeah, he's trying to take him for everything. Uh, yeah. He apparently had a prenup, which mm. every person should have before they get married. 
if the person has more money than the other person. Mm. That's what I think. Yeah, yeah. That's what I think. Uh, I never thought a, about it like that. Man. Well, but, me, you know, man. but at one point, I guess she claims that he ripped the prenup up in front of her. Mm-hmm. But probably not the original. <laughs> Maybe a Xerox <laughs> of it. So now they're trying wow. to get the prenup thrown out. She wants $2 million a month uh. in, uh, in alimony. Mm-hmm. Uh, apparently, three of his side chicks are being dragged into court as well. <laughs> mm. They're showing pictures of them. They're mm. not exactly what you'd expect yeah. <laughs> as a, for Dr. Dre's harem. But, you know, <laughs> it is what it is. Uh, it's just so... I know it's just disappointing, you know, because I mean, Dre is one of one of my heroes, you know, yeah, to Dre see him go is, through yeah. that. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, and deep down, I hope he can put it in a in a category of how much, you know, maybe, maybe me, poor old me, I look at it, things differently. Um, hopefully, you can put it in a category of he's going, he's he's going to live past this. Of it's course, gonna, of course, it's like what. A, if he gets to a point where it's like, whatever, let the lawyers do their thing. He's going to live on. He's going to, you know, be happy. How much do you really need? Really? I mean, if you sit, if you sit sitting yeah. around here thinking about your wounds, yeah. you you can do that I, to the I, rest I, of your days. Listen, I I feel. Listen, if you're married. Mm-hmm. A lot of your success comes from your wife being by your side. Mm-hmm. You know, your your wife is your main sounding board. Yes. She's going to should listen be. to you. You know, she should be. And this is the person you confide in. This is the person that will probably give you the best advice. Yeah. Because there's no ulterior motives. Mm-hmm. If you win, they win. And, and yes. vice versa. And the children win and, and the household wins and so forth. I get that part completely. And I understand that if the relationship doesn't work out, you know, that woman should not walk away with nothing and have to start over. Right. I get it. <laughs> but I, I know I know the butt was coming. But, I know what the butt is. But yeah. The way the laws are set up, mm-hmm. if you make a hundred million dollars and you're together for 10 years. The way the laws are set up is now you owe that woman fifty million, mm-hmm. knowing damn well that the two of you have been spending that hundred million together along the way, mm-hmm. and you may not have fifty million dollars liquid anymore. Right. So you telling me you got to get a divorce, and then you have to go in the hole and go into debt because you owe a person fifty million dollars? What can you do about it though? Prenup. Well, I'm saying it's called a prenup. Uh, yeah, well, that's and the prenup doesn't pre, mean that the person like, should get zero. You mm-hmm. should say, you know, for example, I'd always heard the rumor. I don't know if it's true or not that before Wiz Khalifa and Amber Rose got married, they have a prenup for a million dollars. True, it didn't work out. They had a kid, and, and you know, prenups don't include child support at all. Yeah, but but, what but I'm saying, you know, yeah, they got divorced. She got a million dollar check. What, what what does he do now? I'm saying it's like because what does who do now? You know, well, Dre do now. I mean, like what I'm talking about is like. How did how does he handle it from here on? And that's what I'm I'm, I'm speaking of. What do you, what what can you do? You can you can only let your lawyers do what they can do, and live with the result. You can't change the laws, right? So, I mean, you can't go back in time because I mean I've tried that; it doesn't work. <laughs> You know, so going back in time, <laughs> right? Yeah, I've tried to go to the no, time machine. It really doesn't work. It, doesn't yeah, work. it really doesn't it. work. Yeah. But I mean, I'll tell you one thing, man. The word divorce has been one of the greatest words in my lifetime because if it wasn't for a divorce, I wouldn't be the happiest person on the planet <laughs> that I know of. Because you got divorced at one point? I've got, I, I was divorced, and my ex wife is happier than she ever was with me, <laughs> and I'm happier than I ever was with her. We're happy for each other. I mean, it's not divorce could be a horrible word, or it could be the greatest word. I mean, I, you know, I'm with the love of my life because of divorce. Okay, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I got it. There's there's life on. I mean, I wish that for everybody. I wish that for Dre. I wish there's. I wish Dre would be concentrated on. You know what? Whatever that is, I'm gonna create this in the future, and yeah. so he don't even. Think about that. Yeah, I mean, look at Jeff Bezos. When he got divorced, mm-hmm. 
uh, his wife got how many billions of dollars? Yeah. Well, let's take, take a look. Yeah, can you, can you imagine me sitting around thinking about how much I lost in my divorce now? It'd be a waste of my damn time. You know, and it's a waste of everybody's time. Like I said, I tried uh, to go back and I can't. She got $38 billion. Who? With Jeff Bezos' ex-wife. Mm-hmm. $38 billion. She became the world's richest woman overnight. Okay. Uh, mm-hmm. He made that money back when Amazon stock price continued to go up. Yeah, well, hey. <laughs> he literally if, made if it if back he, and then yeah, some. If he, hopefully, if he loved this woman, he loves her now and, and hopes the best for her future. And yeah. I mean, the way I look at it is like, man, if, if my ex-wife, I want her to be the happiest woman on the planet. Right. That's the truth. I mean, you know, it's like, can I but, think about like, like my past with somebody that I don't wish well for? That's a that's a true waste of time, you know. I wish the best for anybody who's shared that kind of intimacy. Oh yeah, with me. no. Listen, I, you know? I wish the, the best for all my exes. Yeah, some of them are doing well, some of them not so much. <laughs> okay, yeah. I, I, I any any I want anybody who's who I've come in contact with to be living their best life. I got it, I, it but you know, I, I'm I'm pretty no matter sure. what they've done. To okay, me. you got divorced what year? I don't know. 2011, maybe? Okay. Something like that? Roughly 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Now, if the situation was slightly different and you were telling me, like, Vlad, I'm still paying off $100,000 a year to my ex-wife and I'm living in a a one-bedroom apartment Mm -hmm. because every penny I make has to go to this damn divorce settlement. Mm -hmm. I don't think you'd be wishing her as well as you're wishing her right now. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I'm a weirdo. No, I would be because I'm not going. The fact is, I can't change. Like it's like me okay. All right. feel, feeling like, oh, I, I don't have the ability to fly and be getting pissed off of. <laughs> I, you know, it's it I is what it is. I got yeah, it. Yeah, I can't change that, and I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna put a whole bunch of power into something I can't change. No, I got you. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, just recently, it was announced that Amazon Prime Video bought the rights to Eddie Murphy's Coming to America too. Mm. Uh, Lunell was in it. She was telling me about uh, yeah. the whole process. It was actually filmed on Tyler Perry's set. Oh, cool. Primarily. Uh, the thing that was interesting, because this is such an anticipated movie, and depending on who you talk to, I would say most people would say that Coming to America was Eddie Murphy's best movie. It's one of the funniest movies ever. Yeah. Uh, I, I consider it the second funniest movie ever. What was the first uh, Mighty Python and the Holy Grail. That's just me. Okay, all right. Yeah. Nerding out here. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I watched that movie. Yeah. I'll take Coming to America over Holy Grail, but Holy yeah, Grail yeah. is a classic as well. Yeah, yeah. Now, this movie was sold to Amazon for $125 million, mm. which seems low, doesn't it? $125 million? Yeah. Shoot, a comedy making $125 million is major. You know, uh, sounds sounds big to me. I don't know how much did how much did it cost? Uh, yeah, how much did it cost? No, no, the budget's not listed. I assume mm. it cost like a hundred million to make, or something like that. Does that, that seem like a hundred? I have no clue. I mean, we, we don't we don't know because we haven't seen it yet. Well, but I'm I, assuming I, it's I just, a big it's budget. It's hard for me to imagine it would cost that much. Okay, just fair because enough. it's it's Eddie Murphy movies like. You know when you when your equity and is in the performance. I mean, this you know it's like that's what's that's what's brilliant about it. Uh, Eddie Murphy's in a frame like this and presenting comedy that's <laughs> that's the equivalent of CG and whatever that you, you you might compare to another movie. But that's the brilliance of it is it's about comedy. So I don't know why it would cost a great deal. I see what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, I just figured, you know, coming to America, there's going to be a lot of scenes in Africa, and that's going to require a lot of special effects and, you know, potentially locations and, and everything mm-hmm. else like that. Eddie's going to want a nice check for himself. Possibly, uh, yeah, yeah. There's a lot see, of actors I be, in I there. I could be way off because, I mean, know, I make movies on, on a shoestring bu- budget. You know? Right. So, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I look at it like... Kind of like Tyler Perry does. Okay, Tyler's yeah. like you know, nah. we could re we could reuse that food for the, you know. Nah, it's not it's not that bad, but 
Tyler is frugal. <laughs> uh, the way he said he reuse makes... the food. <laughs> Yeah, you know, <laughs> that sandwich down. <laughs> Don't throw it away. There's still yeah. some meat on it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Who wants part of a sandwich? <laughs> right. You know, it's, it's, Tyler will not waste stuff. You know, it's like yeah, that no, that I that, got that you. you know that 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 craft service table. We can use that in this shot. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, yeah. I, me I too. guess. I guess me my too. thing was uh, when I saw this, and then I saw the new Borat movie. And was very disappointed mm. in the new Borat. Uh, I almost feel like Amazon might be like the place where if your movie isn't quite good enough for some of the bigger platforms like mm. Netflix or HBO, that Amazon might, might buy it. Mm. That's kind of what I'm feeling right now. But hopefully mm. I'll be disappointed because I've never seen a really spectacular movie or series on Amazon. I've seen some good ones. Mm. But not any really like spectacular ones, right. like I've seen on Netflix. Right, right. You know, right. so I'm hoping this is not the case. Me too. Me too. Because I, I, I couldn't be a bigger Eddie, Mur Eddie Murphy fan. Yeah, Eddie I Murphy mean the too. best. He should be on the currency. Best, as as best I'm ever. Saying. I mean, comedic actors. I can't think. No, of no. Them. There's nobody. I can't think of a better person. There's just simply nobody in Eddie Murphy's sphere. Period. There's I agree. nobody. I mean, people, if you really start thinking about the effect that Eddie Murphy has on just culture, I mean, just he's just said things as part of the lexicon of our language. You know, banana in the tailpipe. This, the, yeah. There's so, there's, it's too many things. He brought back James Brown from the dead, right. from imitating him. Then it started as a DJ, you know. They, then they started using the Eddie Murphy part of his James his James Brown impression mm -hmm. in music, and then other people started doing it, and it brought James Brown back. And just in comedy, he changed comedy. Before it was, everybody was a version of of um, Richard Pryor, scared Negro comedy. Charlie Barnett, if you're old enough to know who he was, uh, uh, T K Car. Uh, uh, not TK, yeah, TK Carter, uh, Cleavon Littles, all that. It's very the scared guy. And then Eddie Murphy comes, and it's the smart, the wise, yeah, the 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 smartest guy in the room, sharp, yeah, no. and tell it, you know, that whole thing. And then that's been that's the standard to this day, right? I, I remember an interview with him in the '80s, and he was talking about Beverly Hills Cop, mm -hmm. and he said up until those movies, the black guy has always been, you know, partnered with the white guy and it's like, where are we going, boss? Exactly. You know, and Eddie Murphy whereas, changed all of that. Whereas you watch Beverly Hills Cop and Axel Foley's the boss. Yep, yep. Everyone's chasing after him, trying to figure out what his next move is and, and he's giving everyone else direction and he's masterminding everything. And, and is, is, that not, is that not Will Smith? Is that not Chris, Chris Tucker? Yeah. All, Everybody who followed him, yeah, and even like psychologically, when people go into their their alter ego voices, they kind of do an Eddie Murphy voice. They they they, they kind of do Eddie Murphy as someone's other alter ego thing. There's just so there's so much of, even in music. I mean, in music, and then and here's the thing that to me just it's just um, just seals everything. His comedy, stand up, everything. Here's one element that se separates Eddie Murphy from everyone else. He did it all clean. No drugs, no, no, no enhancement to his talent. Who ever did that? Stone cold sober, funniest guy on the planet. Nobody else could brag about that. This dude, I mean, yeah. To me, this it's it, and then on top of it, you know, I got you know, I'll, it, the movies he did, man. I did Outlaw Johnny Black as homage to what Eddie Murphy has done, and I think some of the, his great, his great um, slate of films when he did Coming to America, the Boomerangs, and and all the the whole family could watch these things. 
They oh, were yeah. brilliant. Yeah, no, I watched. And they they yeah. uplifted us the same way that that Sidney Poitier and Bill Cosby did in their string of movies. Eddie Murphy kind of came back with Harlem Nights. Mm-hmm. I, I I hadn't had that feeling till Eddie Murphy was doing those type of movies, and that's that's what I want to do. Yeah, no, I watched Boomerang with a friend of mine for the first time, and she was just like, "Wow!" And mm-hmm. she was like, you know. This is the black female and she was just like yo like this is so dope like a black advertising agency with black executives like yeah and it's not even a, a it wasn't a black agency it was just a a An agency. successful agency Absolutely. and it just so happened to be run by black people and yeah. it was like it just worked so well and it sent out such a cool statement you know mm-hmm. what i mean like yeah. every and it wasn't like Everyone was wearing suits. Everyone was professional. Mm-hmm. There were boardrooms. It wasn't just a bunch of nonsense. Right. It, right. it was like, yo, like this is this is actually like a how it should be. Yeah. You know, as, as opposed to a caricature of, yeah. of what I, it is. I am so glad Eddie Murphy's making movies like that again. Yeah. I am so glad because uh, you know that that's that's been some of my favorite uh, of 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 any time uh, of any star. Uh, just on so many levels, I think it's so um, so welcome now. Got it. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, you mentioned Bill Cosby, who's mm-hmm. still locked up. Yeah. Another one of the greats. No matter what yeah, you Bill say, Bill Cosby was amazing. I mean, mm-hmm. he he changed the game. I mean, you know, people said there would not be an Obama if it wasn't for the Cosby show mm-hmm. and kind of putting out those types of uh, I- imagery. You know how you know how the Bill Cosby affected my life directly? How's that? Well, this is the truth. My ex-wife became a uh, OBGYN because of Bill Cosby show. Cuz that's what he was. I mean, and she basically she was like a young <laughs> mom with no particular money and put herself through school. I mean, she actually donated bone marrow to get extra money to just just to put herself through school. Hmm. She did everything because of Bill Cosby. And then my current wife, she had scholarships. She had basketball scholarships to several colleges. She went to uh to Howard because of of um a different world. Only because of that. Hmm. That she went to to Howard and went to an HBCU. Oh yeah, when uh, Lunell interviewed uh, Sinbad, mm-hmm. uh, you know, for Vlad TV, and Sinbad obviously worked with Bill Cosby on a different world as right. well. Remember mm-hmm. he was on the show, and he said he goes, "Well, listen, I, I don't know about all the other stuff, but I've never seen a more generous man than Bill Cosby in terms of paying scholarships for people mm-hmm. just just to do it." Right, right. For me, it wasn't just that knowing his history, knowing. Uh, what he did with movies, how, how money, how he sent kids to college, never told kids that he gave them that money for college. And the things he just did, and even the things he did in charity, he never told anybody about. And I'm, I, I'll never forget, I was with him at a, at a college, and I think I was at Hampton. And this girl came in, she had lost her scholarship, and Bill and I were doing a show there. And Bill went back in that registrar's office and said, if she has the gumption to come back in here and to fight to stay in school, I'll pay for all four years. He said, don't tell her it's me. So I guess the girl goes back in and say, hey, you just got a scholarship. And they said, from who? He said, you just got a scholarship. Well, she finds out later it's Bill Cosby. So what, two, three years later, she chases Cosby down and thanks him. He goes, cool. She goes, no, I want to thank you. He goes, all I ask you to do is pay for it. She goes, I don't understand. He goes, I saw your need. I just asked you to pay it for it. Yeah. And um, he's still locked up. Yeah, he, I mean, he looks like he's in bad shape, also. I mean, yeah, but I mean, he's an old a, man. He's mostly blind. I mean, it's it's a uh, it's one of those things. But you know, he went to court and he got convicted mm-hmm. by a jury. Uh, you know, so I don't, I don't, you know, you can't really just say it's all bullshit because he went through the legal system. He he could afford the best lawyers. That I don't say buy. it's bullshit at all. Yeah, not at, not even at. I yeah. mean, it's just this. It's again, again. If there's it's a theme the, to the this, the artist and the art. You yeah, know, separating a, the artist and the if art. If there's a theme to this, is like 
you can't get high on your own supply. Or, right. Or you just, it, the ego thing is is your to your detriment. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, you know, we're going to end it with this. Um, since our last interview, I did a, uh, I did a, a long sit down with uh, Rodney Jerkins, mm -hmm. a.k.a. Dark Child, uh, one of the greatest producers uh, really ever. Mm -hmm. um, you know, not only did he uh, sell over a billion albums, <laughs> you know, with hits from, you know, pretty much everyone from Destiny's Child to Whitney Houston to Sam Smith to, to everyone. Uh, but he actually uh, was the primary producer for Michael Jackson's last album. And, uh, you know, he just talked about all the times that they spent together. Michael invites me to his townhouse up in Manhattan one day, right? And we were like, we were probably like 80% done working at this point on his project. And he says, Ryan, I need you to come up. So I go over there for the first time. And no, this was the second time because the first time we played pool, we, we used to play pool and bet each other. And so this is the second time. Wait, wait how much would Michael Jackson bet in pool? Well, we he beat me, man. The first time he beat me, we bet, we bet DVDs. Okay. So, and the funny thing is he wouldn't let me like, he t we went to Times Square like that night at like 11.30 at night. We went to Times Square because he wanted the DVDs that he won. He beat me. And he, so I had to buy the DVDs that night. But the funny thing is, is like the next time we played, the next time we went over to his house, I'm sitting there and we just talking really about nothing. It was just like, yo, we just kicking it. And then I went to the user restroom and I saw a, a note, like a note he wrote in the restroom saying, talk to Rodney about his publishing. So I'm like, yo, huh. this is why I'm here. Like, and he, so then I come back and he goes, so I want to talk to you about something. He goes, I want to talk to you about your publishing and see if you're interested in selling it to me. He wanted to buy your publishing. Yeah. Um, you know, Michael Jackson, you know, he said that really probably felt like he was dead for his last 10 years because you have this guy that gave so much and put everything into, into his, his art and became the biggest, you know, entertainer of all time. But, and, you know, everyone is like, oh, you know, we love Michael Jackson, but you and I are old enough to remember the last 10 years of Michael Jackson, he was not celebrated. Mm -hmm. He was wacko jacko. Right. You know, he was the guy with all the weird plastic surgery. He mm -hmm. was the guy that was bleaching skin white, um, yeah. you know, whether he had vitiligo or not. Um, you know, and after he passed, the Leaving Neverland, documentary came out yeah and the guys who were featured in it sued him but just recently the lawsuit was dismissed hmm. which uh i think is pretty dope hmm. you know i think you shouldn't even be able to sue a dead person yeah i agree with that one um <sighs> Yeah, that's a uh, that that whole scenario. I, I don't know, you know, much to speak about. It just kind of all kind of um, that's that's a sticky one. That, that entire it is a around. sticky one because he had no business being around those kids. Mm -hmm. Point blank. Period. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, especially after the allegation started, you know, at the, at the at the first glimmer of it, be like, okay, cool, all right, I'm done, I'm done. Well, yeah, but that whole that whole thing, man, talking about enabling and and someone creating their own thing with no, it that's so dangerous. I mean, here's the most famous person who I would say Michael Jackson was the famous most famous person who ever lived. Because, I mean, I would say, like, hey, you say Jesus Christ, but there's a whole Muslim population and youngsters who didn't know who he was. But from Michael Jackson, from 5 to 95, you knew who this, was, this guy was anywhere on the planet. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody has ever been that famous. And therefore, no one is going to be more sequestered than him. Uh, but it's like... When I would look at like the some things that just to me that r rang just absolutely delusional, of oh I only had one nose job. 
<laughs> um, All right. These are my children. <laughs> You're darker than me, dude. You're dark. My, like, you, you, people forget. Michael Jackson is darker than me with Negroid features. That's what he really looks like. He doesn't... You, so if Eddie Murphy said, this blonde hair, blue-eyed child is mine, what, how would people react? If, if well, someone on top bad, of that, you know what I mean. His his brothers, I believe, all of them have children with white women, or the majority of them have children with white women, mm -hmm. and the kids all look mixed. Right, <laughs> they all look black. Yeah. So, so why why the hell is it Mike's? Even if even if the mother to have three to have three, and none of them look at all black. Right. Is and you know, so it's like if you're saying. Oh yeah, my child came out. He he looks just like Tito, and and he reminded me like like no no no. There's a delusion. That this is this is sad. This is, yeah, this got nothing to do with reality. Especially when you say, "I have all this level of talent in my DNA," mm -hmm. right? Not to say that everything gets passed down to your children, mm -hmm. right? Because obviously you see that that's not true. Right. You look at the world of entertainment or sports, yeah, some, you know, I mean, Kobe's dad was a great mm -hmm. basketball player, but I'm sure, you know, I mean, I know for a fact the majority of basketball players have kids that can't play for shit, mm -hmm. right? But, mm -hmm. but here you are, you have this, you know, almost alien level of talent. Why would you not want to, at least have the potential to pass that down to your children. You know what I'm saying? You literally are taking the sperm from a completely different man and creating children that have no uh, no genetic, uh, you know, uh, there's nothing genetically attached to these children from you at bruh, all. Bruh, at all. The theme from this interview, I feel if... If you have power, if you if you have an excuse to say what you want in your heart or whatever delusion that you want, you will jump on that excuse. He wants to say that this is his child and the world, it's like the emperor's new, new clothes. <laughs> right. The people, the sycophants around you is going to, they're going to enable you to create whatever world you want. Tupac, Michael Jackson, you know? Yeah, that's right, you're right. Yeah, that's your, because we, if we wanna believe that's his children, we want, we, we do that. Yes, that's his beautiful child, that's his child. You know, you're not thinking, well, what does this guy really look like? He doesn't look like, he's not, you know, whatever color that he is. Right. That's not that's not his regular color. So, so right, it's, right. plastic surgery is not passed down to your children. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So so it's like uh, okay, like you know, but you tell a Michael Jackson fan this, they don't want to hear it because. Oh yeah, I've yeah, gotten into going, it. Yeah. I've, I've trolled Michael Jackson a few times. Yeah, yeah. You know, so it's like, like, like okay, I, well, I remember I put up a picture of Michael Jackson, pretty young thing, and I said, you know. Does this album cover ring a little different after leaving Neverland? And people are like, "Oh, fuck you, Vlad! I hate you." They, 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 <laughs> they you know, you know, it's it's uh, it's interesting. In this world, his own they, nephew started arguing with me. It was, it was ridiculous. They, I, I was they, just joking. Come they on, rather get over believe it. the fantasy of something than real. Okay, I I have these friends. Guess what? They're 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 not they're not real friends. They're Facebook friends. But but you're using the word friends, and so, somewhere in your psyche, you've got a bunch of friends. They're, they're imaginary friends. They're not your real <laughs> friends. But it's been more important for people to create this illusion, the, the, the world that they want to believe. And it's like, whoa, okay, bless you. Uh, it's not good for the psyche. It's just not good, whether we talk about, just like I say, this theme, <laughs> where a lot of people are creating... This alternate reality, they, they they basically are falling for the banana and tailpipe. Right. <laughs> and letting their friends or whatever, the people who, who worship them, kind of help them create that world. Like I was talking about before, my own mom 
wouldn't correct me when I was, and she didn't know I was messing with her when I said I was, you know, getting rid of hitchhikers under my house. <laughs> she still was like, oh, that's good. I'm like, you're not listening to me. I, you know, I, I, I did the experiment on that where I watched the people around me change because I connected them to a world that they didn't have a connection to before. So now in their, you know, in their little motor pool or the, around the water cooler, people say, hey, what's Mike up to? Oh, he's doing another movie. Hey, that's Mike. You know, it connect. It's what they. It, it it made their world a little bit bigger, but it can help color the world that I want. If I wanted to, like, go off. If if I wanted to think I'm better than someone else or whatever, and create this alternate world, and had like you know I'm walking around in kung fu uniforms all the time. <laughs> you know what I mean, like Bruce Leroy. <laughs> Everybody's going to enable me to do it. I just need to, hopefully, luck, luckily, I didn't come up with that. I can't, it came up with going, hey, man, I'm just doing a job. It's a great job. It's a wonderful job. But I'm an entertainer. I'm here to serve you. We're all servants, right? You're a servant. I'm a servant. Mm -hmm. This thing serves a, a, a need for people. Yeah. And, I, and thank goodness for that. And uh, somebody who says, oh, well, you know, I like what Mike said. If they, they identify with me, well, there's, there's something that they're gaining from it. And I'm gaining because this is what I was put on the earth to do, to, to serve. I've, I've been put on earth. I always say like the two important, I borrow, borrow this, quote, this quote, but the two important, most important days in your life is the day you were born and the day you find out why. You mm. know? And so, hey, I found out why what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm supposed to be doing what I'm doing right now, you know, in this industry. To think that I'm better than somebody is ridiculous. I'm serving you, you know, I'm, I'm a servant. Yeah. I, I'm an entertainer, you know, and that's, that's what I'm supposed to do. But I'm, I'm, I'm blessed to, to know that. And, and that's just the truth of it, you know, that, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm happy, to have found that out. That's how we're going to end it. Mm -hmm. Michael Jai White. Always a pleasure, man. <laughs> My pleasure, honor. bro. Thank you so right. much for sitting down uh, with us again. And you're going to mm -hmm. see Michael a lot more on the show in the months to come. Yeah. And, uh, man, listen, appreciate everything, man. Appreciate you coming back. And, uh, you know, uh, best of luck with everything you're doing. I know you have a bunch of movies in the works. Yeah, I got seven. Seven movies in the works. Seven movies Woo! in the works, yeah. That's you like know, in the can. In the can, a 30-year yes, career. Sir. You know, like I, I recently interviewed Leon, who has a 40-year career. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, it's absolutely. kind of weird yeah. when you when you think about these people you grew up watching mm -hmm. and they're still doing it. Yeah. Uh, like yourself, 30 years in, seven movies in the can, producing, got your own film company. Can't wait to see the full version of uh, Outlaw Johnny Black. That's, yeah. that's the one I'm looking forward to. Yes, sir. Me too. You know? All Until right. next time. All right. Peace.